Caroline, Willie, D. Mace, 1025-1063, The Game and The Game Nashville app. We're streaming live on Twitch, Twitter, YouTube, and Facebook Live every single day. And today we are broadcasting from Barrel House at Bridgestone Arena because the Predators are back in action here tonight, taking on the Vegas Golden Knights. Puck drop at 7 o'clock. Pre-game coverage starting at 6 p.m. on 1025 and 1063, The Game. It is is a big one tonight for the Nashville Predators D Mace. Vegas Golden Knights get a win in overtime at St. Louis. So the Blues get a point. Vegas gets two. Quick turnaround in Nashville tonight. Willie Donick will join us in just about an hour. He's out at Morning Skate. But D Mace is here. D Mace, how we doing? Hey, I'm doing well. Nice um, wet day outside. Um, and but other than that, you know, things are great. I can't complain. I woke up this morning. That's I'm the here, most important thing. Doing a radio show. That's all that matters. And my kids are healthy, so I'm good. But I do, uh, you know, I do want to say something. And it's pertaining to the Nashville Predators. Okay. Yeah. Because every show that I listen to on our station, it's this is the big game. This is the big game. No, this is the game they prove that they can hang with the big boys. This is the game. Well, they've been doing that. And that's what I'm getting at. Like, when is it going to be? And I understand sort of the ramification. It's a big game from the standpoint of this. I think they still make the playoffs, but what spot are they in? Yes. Which wild card spot are they in? In the way they're playing hockey, I don't give a damn who they play in the first round. I think they're capable of winning. They've beaten the Floridas. They've beaten the Colorados. They've beaten every Vegas. every Vegas, every team that 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 has come up against the Nashville Predators since what was it? May, I mean on February, mid February, somewhere around. After now. the Dallas loss. After the Dallas loss. Every haven't they proven that this is no longer a fluke? Mm -hmm. This they are a good team. I think sometimes. You know, what happens is, well, I know what happens a lot of times with, with, with teams that change coaches, that have some new faces, change GMs or whatnot. I can speak from the coach part and the player part. When you change coaches, new players come in. You got to get used to, you got to buy into what they're teaching you. Mm -hmm. It's not that you don't want to do it. It's something new. I got to get myself used to doing this because I've been doing this for the last three seasons. Now we change, you know, we change philosophies. Head coach, now I got to learn how to do this. It's not that I'm fighting against it. It's that I, I'm learning in the process. Now, I'm going to pick it up pretty fast, but that's just me. The team as a whole may not pick it up faster than certain individuals. So when you see a team that struggle with a new coach, a coach that you deem is a good coach, a damn good GM, and has some good players, that first half of the season is going to be getting used to things, um, learning things. Not that I'm learning players, but I'm learning how they work in this new system. Mm -hmm. So by the middle of the season, if we are a good team, we will start to play. You will start to see it. Things start to click. It's, things start to click. It's not that we are on this, on a roll now. It's just we figured it out now. We know how to play together. Now we are the team that we thought we could be at the beginning of the season, but it just took some time to get here. I think that's where the Predators are at not right now. This was a team that I think once everything got established at the beginning of the season, in their minds they figured we can do this. Mm -hmm. But there's going to be some growing pains, maybe a lot of them. But once we get it together, and it depends on how fast we get it together, certain players got to get it together first. Once our older guys, our veteran guys, our leaders, once they get into it, they figure it out. Then the younger guys start figuring it out. Then the younger guys figure out where I am supposed to be within this scheme. How do I best operate? The coach knows now after 20, 30 games, okay, this player – and this player, they play best together. Mm -hmm. Let's put them together. Hence, the fourth line while they're playing so good. This is a team that, that, that had promise at the beginning of the season. But because everything was new, they didn't know how it was going to end up. Well, it's ended up pretty good. 
because this is a fundamentally this is a good team. Mm -hmm. The core of this team is good. They just had to catch up to what Coach Bruno was teaching them. And they all had to buy in and trust one another. They had that. This was a good team at the beginning of the season, but because of the change, you didn't see it. Now you see it. This is no longer a hot team. This is no longer a team, at least in my, in my opinion. They don't need to prove anything to every, anybody else. They just need to keep winning. Now it's they're not gonna a hot lose team. Some, they're a good team. Exactly. They're going to lose some games here and there. Just If they lose, lose the next two or three games, are we going to think they're not a good team? Of course not. Hell no, that we're not. It's just ebb and flows of the season. They figured it out. They figured out how to play with one another. They figured out the scheme. Coaches figured out which line works best. Now we can, now we can be the team that we thought we were going to be at the beginning of the season. Regardless if they win tonight versus Vegas or not, this is still a team that you need to be watching. Of course. A team that you don't want to play once you get into the playoffs because the type of hockey they're playing, fast, physical, all that smart hockey, and the goalie is playing lights out right now, both of them, not just one, both of them, Lincoln and two. It's going to be – I don't – again, I don't give a damn who they play in the first round. If they continue to play like this with those two goalies playing the way they're playing in the net, not too many teams going to beat them. Not the Colorados, not the – no, because – Those teams can beat them. They can beat and them. And the Predators will be underdogs. And Absolutely. if I can avoid Colorado, I'd like to avoid Colorado mm – -hmm. But I, I understand and agree with your sentiment. Mm -hmm. To go back to your initial question of why is everyone talking about how all these are big games, it's less in my opinion. Now, however everyone else feels, you know, Predators fans or anyone else on our station feels is different. But the way that I feel is tonight's a big one, not just to continue that the Predators are a good team. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden I'm going to think if they lose tonight that they're a bad team. They're on an eight-game winning streak and a 17-point streak, 17-game point streak. And they've beaten along mm -hmm. those lines legitimate Stanley Cup contending teams. Colorado and Florida and Winnipeg, so on and so forth. They've beaten really good teams, and they haven't just beaten and squeaked by by the hair of their chinny-chin-chin. Chin. No. They beat they've them beaten up. them handedly. Yes. They've dominated for a majority of three periods. They looked really good against good teams. And you know what you are if you look good against a good team? You're a good team, mm -hmm. too. To me, it's more so a big game because I'm looking at the standings. Okay. you got 11 games left. Mm -hmm. You are now three points ahead of the Vegas Golden Knights in the first wild card spot. You're sitting at 88, Vegas at 85, and you are even in the number of games played. You lose this game tonight. Vegas gets two, you get none, you're mm -hmm. sitting one point ahead of Vegas. So I look at it as tonight is a big one because tonight could be the point where you really do once and for all separate yourself and it feels like you're in a really comfortable position mm -hmm. because it's two points that you get and two points that the team sitting behind you doesn't. You would then be at 90, Vegas sitting at 85, and of course you got 11 games left in the mm -hmm. season. Weird things happen, you know, Teams get on hot streaks. You could get on a, hold a cold streak, knock on wood, so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. But tonight's a big one to me because of the separation in the mm -hmm. standings. Not because this team needs to prove anything more to me. This team has proven to me they've got guts and they've got what it takes to make a run in the playoffs. They've got what it takes to be a Stanley Cup contending team. Mm -hmm. I believe that because of what they've done since that truly awful and dreadful game yeah. against Dallas since the U2 concert, <laughs> since Vegas, since the, the sphere, everything that they've proven to me since then shows me that these are contenders. This team is a team that you don't want to face in the playoffs. But tonight to me is important because of standings. And, and, and I get that part, the standings. Um, but my thing is they don't have to prove that they can beat the big boys. They've beaten the big boys, whether mm -hmm. they lose tonight or they win tonight. If they lose this game, I'm not going to think, oh, they can't beat the big boys now. Like, man, they lost to Vegas. Whew. No, I'm going to think, all right. Okay. You how do you regroup now? ended that point streak. Uh -huh. How do you regroup? How do you, how do you respond? How do you and how back? do you get exactly. back on track? Absolutely. I mean, under, under a perfect idea, a perfect situation, other than outright winning again, you want them to get two points or a point. Of course. You want them to leave with a point, period. But, you know, the, the notion of, oh, they get to prove that they can, you know, they can hang with the big boys. They've, they've already that. proven it. They've already proven that. Now, you don't want to, you know, have Vegas come into your building and you lay an egg. You don't want that to happen. You want to be competitive. You want to go out there and continue to play the brand of hockey that you've been playing over the last month and a half. But if it doesn't work out, it at least to me, it's not the end of the world. 
yes, they may become, you know, they may end up being two points behind rather than five. I get it. And and, and, and they need points, period, moving forward. Mm -hmm. But it's not going to make me think that, oh, now all of a sudden they can't hang with the big boys. No. I mean, it is what it is. They've beaten enough good teams on the road at home that I know that if they're playing their brand of hockey, they can beat anybody in the NHL. Not just anybody. They can beat anybody. Anybody. The, anybody in the NFL. They continue to play the brand of hockey that they have been playing or close to it. They can either beat them or they can make it very competitive, come out of it, come out, you know, at the end of the game with at least a point. Mm -hmm. You know, so that's – I'm just – I'm listening to our shows and, 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 you know, you hear the, oh, this is a big game. Yes, it is a big game, and I do understand, like it, you said, from March. your standpoint. Oh, exactly. Every game is big in March. Absolutely. And from a point standpoint, where are you going to be? Are you going to be in the first wild card position or the second? Mm -hmm. But from a what do we think about this team or if I think this team, you know, can hold their own against top opponent, yeah, they can. They've already proven it. Mm -hmm. They've already proven they can uh, – they've already proven they can shut out teams. They've already proven they can score five, six goals if they, need, if they need to. You know, so to me, this is not a, a prove-it game against a big team. It's how do we stay ahead in the points race mm -hmm. moving forward. Well, they've proven that they have great to elite goaltending, mm -hmm. not just with UC Saros, but like you said with Kevin Lankinen. They've proven that the Andrew Burnett offensive system works. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think Saturday night against Detroit was the exception and not the rule with but they how found this another Predators, way to win. They found another way to win. Mm -hmm. But really, I mean, they've consistently been putting up four, five, six goals a game. Like offensively, it's clicking. Mm -hmm. Defensively, it's clicking, and you're getting great goaltending. That's all the formula mm -hmm. of being a competitive team in the playoffs. And of course, I know the Stanley Cup playoffs. Weird things happen, mm -hmm. and it's hard to win. There's a reason why it's regarded as the hardest trophy in sports to win. But still, this is a team that is playing like a contending team. Now, I think that, because you bring up a good point of, every day, it's a big game, and not when you <laughs> use big game, it starts to lose its yes. meaning. Okay, like every single game from now until the end of the season is a big game. I think that for me, the factor of if it's a quote-unquote big game or not mm -hmm. is if there's massive implications one way or another. Okay. That if you win the game, you put yourself in a great position, which I think if the Predators do win tonight, they do put themselves yes. in a good position mm -hmm. because they separate themselves with five points against the Vegan, Vegas Golden Knights. It's like It feels like double points to me. Games like this mm -hmm. against teams that are on the bubble or in this instance, Vegas, who's right behind you in a wild card spot, feels like double points because it's two points you get and it's zero points that they get. So that's massive implications one way. On the other side, you can't call it a big game, and then if you turn around and lose, say it was no big deal. Mm -hmm. Because then it really wasn't exactly. that big of a game. It was it a big game or not. <laughs> if the Predators do lose this game tonight, you're kind of getting a little uncomfortable. Now you see Vegas, they're creeping up. You only have a one-point lead, and now you do. The Predators, as in you, the Predators have a more favorable schedule throughout mm -hmm. the rest of their season. I know that they've got Colorado coming up on mm -hmm. Saturday, but they've got the Coyotes, and they've got – Chicago, mm -hmm. and they've got underachieving teams on the rest exactly. of their schedule. Vegas does not. Vegas has a more difficult schedule coming up, so at least you have that kind of in your favor. But still, a one-point lead, that makes you feel a little uncomfortable. So it's it's big swings. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to say massive swings. I'm not going to say the hugest implications because there are still games left in the season. Yes. But there's big swings one way or another in the standings depending on the outcome tonight, which is why I think this makes it a big game. Mm -hmm. No, I, I get it from that standpoint. Um, you know, the the point separation. Um, you want to be able to go into a game, lead the game, mm -hmm. and either, you know, keep it status quo or expand your um, – your uh, separation or expand your point differential. You feel a little uh, bit more comfortable. Yes, you feel more comfortable. So that way you're into, not going into the final few yeah. games of the season saying so we have to win. I these. get it from that standpoint, yeah. point standpoint. And it's really, you know, even though I think they do have a, uh, let me look at this. I was just looking at this this morning. Um, they do have an opportunity to, um, here we go, right here. They do have an opportunity possibly to catch, is it Edmonton? It would be Winnipeg in the Winnipeg, Central. Winnipeg, yeah, Winnipeg. So they got an opportunity. You're five points back now, of catch, Winnipeg. Yeah, you, got, you, you have an opportunity to catch Winnipeg. So it's not just, to me, I would look at it from this standpoint. 
it's not just about keeping um, Vegas at bay. It's about now we are in reach of Winnipeg. We are in serious, like, realistically, we are in reach of Winnipeg. Now, I don't know how Winnipeg's um, schedule looks moving forward. We know that the National Predators' um, schedule is more favorable to them, but I don't know how Winnipeg's um, schedule looks. But that's where you It's not easy. They've got Edmonton tonight, Vegas on Thursday, Ottawa Mm. Saturday. That's just the next three games, but that's not not easy in the slightest. You've got three, you know, playoff contending teams Exactly. So if you can... You can win tonight. You can pick up two points tonight and say you could pick up another two within the next two or three games. Then you put yourself closer if indeed Winnipeg does lose two or the three, hell, all three or one of the three, it does put you closer to Winnipeg. That should be, if you are looking at a prize or a goal, that should be the goal because that's right now, that's the only team that you can catch to mm-hmm. sort of get out of that first wild card spot. Again, I know the point uh, implications is big this game, but as far as, you know, how we match up against teams around the NHL, they've already proven. They, they, match, they can match up with teams, you know. They may not always be the better team, but because I think the way that they play, uh, the attitude that they have, they close that. It, it sort of balances it out once you get on the ice. Mm-hmm. You know, yeah, you may have a few more skaters than we do. You may have one or two more scores, but the way we play, you know, puts us closer to you than not. Not because we have what you have, but because of the grit that we play with. And you can tell they're feeling it. Yeah. But I mean, you've been there, D-Base. Yeah. You know what that feeling's like and in a locker like room. Nobody can beat you. Mm-hmm. It's not a cockiness. It's it's not an arrogance. It's a confidence. Mm-hmm. Like nobody like. If we go out here and we do the things that we have been doing, no one can beat us. There's nobody can beat us. Our our goalies are playing lights out right now. Nobody can beat us if we continue to play the way we have been playing. That's just confidence. It's not cockiness. It's not arrogance. It's just co- co- confidence that if we do the things that we have been doing um, thus far, then – there's no – y'all should be more worried about us than us worried about you. Mm-hmm. You know, we know who we are as a team, and we're going to go out each and every day and play that way. Do y'all know who y'all are as our teams, as teams, when y'all face us? That's the way I look at it. This is no longer just some, you know, ho-hum, rebuilding Predators team no. that's just happy to be here and would be lucky to find themselves in the playoffs. No. This is not a rebuilding team. Mm-hmm. This is a – Frankly, a fairly veteran team. Yeah. And this is a team that's playing better than any other team in the National Hockey League. This isn't a team that just be lucky to find itself Mm -hmm. in the playoffs. No. I said it yesterday, and I will say it again. This is no longer about making the playoffs. Mm -hmm. It's about what you can do in the playoffs. How competitive you could make a first round against a Colorado or a Dallas. It's about... Can this team make it to the second round of the playoffs? Mm-hmm. This isn't just a, we're happy to be here. We overachieved. No, 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 no. This is who this team is now. And that's a good position to oh, be it in. Is. It you is. You want to be in this position. And I'll ask you a question that I want to ask Willie. And, of course, Willie will join us here in just a few moments. He's out at Morning Skate. This is a question that I know Willie's going to hate. This is such <laughs> an anti willie Donick conversation <laughs> because I know that Willie likes to temper expectations uh-huh. But Dimes, are the Predators a Stanley Cup contending team? <coughs> I think they are. Um, again, um, you know, playing whether it's Colorado, Dallas, you know, Winnipeg, Vancouver, any one of these top teams, the Kings, Edmonton, um, they have proven either we beaten them or we played competitive with them, especially over the last month and a half. You flat out beaten them. Um, and you beaten them in a way that, you know, a lot of people probably thought you couldn't. You outscored them, you know, and your deep in, in your goalie and your defense play pretty pretty good. Hell, you went and basically shut out Colorado mm-hmm. with the exception of what the last two goals at the end, end of the game, I believe, toward the end. But you basically shut them out. Um, this team, I and I'm not saying they are the best team. But, yeah, I think this team is capable of winning the Stanley Cup. The way they have played over the last month and a half, and I know, like you said, Willie will hate this question. He'll hate it. 
Oh, he would hate it. He's, oh, I, can, I already he hear would try his to eyes dodge rolling. It. He would try to dodge this question. He'd start talking in that low <laughs> voice. Uh, then he'd probably bring out some analytics or something else. I don't know. But Willie <laughs> hates this question. But I think they can. I, I, I really do. Because you look at how they're built as a team. You look at the line. They're getting uh, contribution from every line now. At the beginning of the year, we were trying to figure out what other lines are going to give us points besides the first line? Mm -hmm. What other lines? Where's gonna, the secondary yeah, where's scoring? Where's the secondary coming from? Wh wh and then all of a sudden, they kick it into gear. They figure it out. Now you got the now you know where the secondary scoring is coming from. Everybody is 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 pulling their weight, so to speak. And with that being said, I do think they have they have the DNA to win a championship, in the sense of they got. You know, Yossi is playing lights out, mm -hmm. playing lights out. Uh, um, Soros is playing lights out right now. Forsberg is playing the best hockey of Forsberg his career. Forsberg is playing the best hockey of his, his career. Then you got these young guys that are playing well. They're all figuring out how we play within this system. Mm -hmm. um, and then some of the older guys, too. You know, now they've figured it out. So, to me, this team with their coach, Coach Bruno, I think they have they have a they have the DNA or they're building the DNA to win championships. I think they can this year. Will it happen? I don't know. Mm -hmm. But listen, teams can get on the roll. People didn't think the 2017 Predator team would make it to the Stanley Cup. What happened? They made it to the Stanley Cup. You know, and then after that, you know, things just started piling up for them mm -hmm. as far as how good they were. We truly saw how good they were after that Stanley Cup run. But, yes, this team does have the capability to make a Stanley Cup run. Will they? I don't know. I, I really don't. I think it's okay to say that they are. Yeah, exactly. Because they're playing uh, you, like one. Exactly. You, why, are, why would you be scared to say after what you've seen over the last month and a half, Good teams, bad teams, it don't matter. Home and away, it don't matter. This team has shown you that they can go out there and, and, and they can play really good hockey. They can play winning hockey over the last month and a half. That just doesn't disappear. Mm -hmm. It doesn't. I could see if they're on a five-game winning streak or something. Okay, let's taper it, you know, because of five games. And, but they've been on this thing for two, uh, almost a month and a half, mm -hmm. I believe spanning what 16 games something like that after what is it you do something for a certain amount of days it become a habit yeah 30 days 20 days 21 days something like that well how they're, they're close to it aren't they they close to that 21 days or whatever it is they have not lost in regulation since mm -hmm. february 15th mm, march 5th yeah it's been over 21 days so this is a habit, <laughs> it's a habit. yeah this is a, this is who they are people yeah this is a habit this is who they are so if you know who you are, then yeah, you would say yeah. They have an op. They can win the Stanley. They can go on the Stanley Cup run. I think it's a natural feeling to get a little bit uncomfortable whenever mm -hmm. the expectations start to raise. But isn't whenever that what the you want? ante gets upped, but that's a good sign. Yes. Because when your expectations rise, that means that the team is playing well. Mm -hmm. That means that you should expect more from this team. I think that they are a contending team because they've beaten other cup contenders, not by a fluke. And it wasn't just once or twice. Mm -hmm. It's now, to use your point, a habitual thing for this Nashville exactly. Predators team. Am I going to place money today on the Nashville Predators winning the Stanley Cup? Mm -hmm. No, I'm probably not. Because I look at teams around the league like maybe the Rangers mm -hmm. or, the, or the Florida Panthers or the Colorado Avalanche that might be more equipped mm -hmm. to go throughout the entirety of a Stanley Cup playoffs to be really competitive and to win those tightly contested seven-game series. So I wouldn't bet on it, mm -hmm. but why not? Okay. Why, why, why wouldn't you call this team at least a contender? That doesn't mean that you're saying today that they are going to win. That just means that, hey, this team can be really freaking competitive in the playoffs. And if you've been watching this team, how could you not say that they wouldn't be really freaking competitive in the playoffs? Don't be scared. Say it. 
Go ahead. Say it with your chest. Go ahead. Say it with your chest. Yes, they can win the Stanley Cup, okay? Yes, we chest. can. <laughs> yes, we can. I want to get your thoughts on this. 615-737-1025 is the phone number. And we will absolutely revisit this with Willie Donick. I know he's going to hate it. <laughs> but we're, we're, we'll help him through it. We're going to support him. We'll, we'll get him through it. We'll get your thoughts on this. Tim Hasselbeck will join us in one hour. We'll get Tim Hasselbeck's thoughts on the luxurious need trade. But coming up next, I do want to transition quickly into some Titans thoughts. Okay. Because... I saw an article on ESPN.com about maybe some under-the-radar moves that every team in the NFL has made. TD wrote his under-the-radar move, and frankly, it wasn't one that I would have thought of, but I think TD is totally spot-on. But is there enough, enough around this quote-unquote under-the-radar move to really pay dividends? We'll get into that coming up next. We'll get into your phones. 615-737-1025 is the phone number. Caroline, Willie, D. Mace, we are brought to you by Zen Sports. Start earning cash rewards on your bets today. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-889-9789. Terms and conditions apply. Must be 21 or older and in Tennessee to bet.
What about the state of your defense? Can you go ahead and give us a little? Yeah, I I think our defense is, um, you know, we've we've made pretty substantial efforts to improve it. Um, Obviously, our our attention to the to the corner position. um, You know, we we had some other targets that you know, especially uh, up front, that we were trying to to either bring back or go sign. And and just like any free agency, you know, you don't get everybody you're targeting. And so we we had some targets that uh, went elsewhere, and that's just the nature of it. But um, excited about the guys we've added. I think we've added some some speed, some aggressiveness um, to the side of the ball that that needs that. I think there's some there's some guys that have some talent. I think Kenneth Murray is a really exciting player to add um, and see if this this scheme fits him and see what he can do in it. Um, you know, and there's still more to add too. We we got we still got plenty of players that we can go pick up here at this point, particularly in the in the draft process as well. All right, there you go. That was Brian Callahan at the NFL owners meetings yesterday. Caroline Willie D. May is live out here at Bridgestone Arena. Predators in action against the Vegas Golden Knights tonight. Also, this coming out of, of, about an hour or so ago from Paul Kuharski, Luxurious Need has passed his physical for the Titans, but per PK, still minor things to be ironed out to finalize the deal. So the official deal and the reason why we haven't heard an announcement from the Tennessee Titans is because the trade was pending a physical, mm-hmm. so the physical has passed. Still minor things to be ironed out. Any ideas of what those minor things could be? And how minor are they? Um, I'm sure it's you know, monetary things, things within the contract, that language probably. Stipulations. Yeah, uh, maybe they want to, you know, clarify it better or change some wording, Um, you know, because at this point I don't think after this, after the, um, after the physical, if nothing, you know, and and Paul is saying this, that, all right, it's all but done, just a Mm -hmm. few things to work out tells me that it's not injury related um, Why do in you a think sense so? because I think there would have been more of a bigger deal mm-hmm. than if they thought something was really wrong with his knee uh, because that's what everyone sort of holding their breath about and mm-hmm. I and I get it uh, whether you missed the game or not I get it um, but if if they thought it was that bad then I think there would have been more of a article from Paul um, but it seems not to be that way. So it's just like, okay, there are a few things they just need to iron out within a contract. It could be language. Uh, it could be something Titans are putting in there to protect them. Mm-hmm. You know, not something major, but just in case. Um, you know, and then part of it could be, and I said this yesterday, um, you know, putting language in there, which they probably already have, but putting language in there saying, if you don't pass a physical, this is what happens, you know, and if it has something to do with the knee or whatnot. So there are things you could put in within the contract to sort of void some of the guarantees because uh, he has a pre-existing, you know, injury or whatnot. Mm-hmm. Um, but I don't think there's anything that the Titans are concerned about that would stop um, this deal from moving forward. I would think the only thing that would stop the deal from moving forward was the failed physical. Yeah. If there was a failed physical, exactly. then I, that would void the trade. But if the, the if he passed the physical, mm-hmm. then fine. You know, with the knees, as far as I'm concerned, is it a concern? I think it has to be. Mm-hmm. Anything that keeps a player off the field, practice field, playing field, whatever it might be, I think should be a concern and something that you monitor. But he still played in 16 games, yeah. and he still played more snaps than any other player on that mm-hmm. Kansas City Chiefs defense. So, yes, it's something to keep – to keep in mind, but no, it's not something that I'm looking at and I'm saying, well, how in the world could you make this move? The knees, because it hasn't <laughs> kept him off of the playing field. Um, but you heard there in that clip from Brian Callahan, he talks about wanting to re-sign players on the defensive line and Rand Carthon sat down with Jim Wyatt at the owners' meetings and he was very candid, said, look, we tried to bring back Aziz Alshire and Denico Autry. They just decided to go elsewhere. Yeah, right. well, hey, that, that's the own. reality of exactly. free agency. Free agency giveth and free agency taketh away. Aziz Alshire played for D'Amico Ryans in San Francisco. Mm-hmm. Denico Autry might be looking at it and saying, I could either make more money in Houston or I'm getting to the end of my career and Houston looks like it's a team more equipped to win than the Titans and if that's what they want to do, then fine. That, yeah. that is 100% your choice. I wish you nothing but the best. But those are still positions that the Titans need to replace. I was looking at this article on ESPN.com, and it's the way too early power rankings, and with each ranking was an under-the-radar move. Now, the Titans are 25th in the NFL power rankings, up from 28. 
Great. Mm-hmm. It means nothing to me at this point, frankly. But TD wrote, an under-the-radar move that the Titans made in the offseason, hiring defensive coordinator Denard Wilson. Frankly, that wasn't something that was top of mind. If I were to pick a quote-unquote under-the-radar move, I maybe mm-hmm. would have picked Lloyd Cushenberry, adding yeah. him onto the offensive line. But when I read that, I thought, Didi, that's a great point. Because I'm excited and encouraged about what Denard Wilson can bring to this defense, and especially the corners that he's going to be working with, adding Chidobi Awuzie mm-hmm. and adding Legereus Need. You've got a solid one-two punch there. I mean, I think Chidobi Awuzie is a very high-end two. Legereus Need is regarded as one of the best corners in the league, and then you've got Roger McCreary in the slot. Denard Wilson, who has proven to be kind of a whisperer in the secondary, I'm looking at that and I'm thinking, what a match made in heaven. Mm-hmm. But there's still the concern lingering for me, d of the secondary looks like it has the makings of being much improved, if not really, really good. Mm -hmm. But how good can the defense be with the defensive line and pass rush as currently constructed? Um, Listen, if you believe in what Denar Wilson can do from a secondary standpoint, which we all should because this team was was, um, sixth and um, passing yards allowed um, this past season, meaning Baltimore's um, pass defense. They only gave up 16 points. A part of that is the defensive line, but also a part of it is the secondary. They had the best the best safety. He worked with the best safety in the National Football League in Kyle, Kyle Hampton. Mm-hmm. Now, you can say he's the best. He's damn sure a top two or three mm-hmm. in this league. So he, ha- he, ha- he has had an opportunity to work with guys like that when he was in Philly. Philly had one of the best, if not the best, secondary in the National Football League. Especially and their secondary when dropped off exactly. whenever he left. Absolutely, especially when it comes to turnovers. So this is what – and TD, TD, I think he, he could be right on this one from this standpoint because they haven't done – you know, I don't we, – we, we talk about Cushenberry, but this is a guy that – you know, you bring him and you know he's going to be good. If he's not good, then you're like, what's going on here? Yeah. So you bring in, bring in Calvin Ridley. These you know guys, he's going to be yeah, good. Yeah, these guys have proven uh-huh. that they can play. But Denard Wilson hasn't proven as a defensive coordinator uh, what he can do. But we know what he can do from a secondary standpoint. So this could be, in, in, in essence, a uh, under the radar sort of higher sign, whatever you want to say, because now you got a guy that comes in with with the pedigree for secondary. What has been our Achilles heels? Secondary. Mm-hmm. That's been the Achilles heels for the Tennessee Titans the last two seasons. We've had a good defensive line. Even with a good defensive line, if those guys can't hold up when those defensive players don't get to the quarterback, you're exposed, and the Titans got exposed a lot over the last two seasons because they couldn't stop anyone in the back end. So you bring in someone that has that has flourished at that particular unit. Mm-hmm. Now you make him the defensive coordinator. Yeah, I'm excited about the move. I'm I mean, excited about it. How could you it. not be fired up after his introductory press conference? I mean, my goodness. Exactly. And then you got to pinpoint two guys that you wanted. Like, you come in as a new coach. You tell the GM and the head coach, these are guys that I like. These are guys that I would love to have. Mm-hmm. Whether it's uh, Chidobia Wizie or Legere Sneed. These are the two guys that I want. Okay, we'll get them. We got them for you. Mm-hmm. That's a plus on both ends. A plus on both ends. Now, what you got to figure out is, what, what are we getting from our defensive line? You don't need big names to have big plays. No, but you do need to replace Danico Autry. Yeah, you got to replace. You got to replace Danico Autry. But sometimes, the, the sacks isn't the end all be all. Even okay, you bring in someone, he may not get ten quarterback snacks. Quarterback sacks, not snacks. <laughs> Quarter, okay, I I'm guess sure they, they are. Appreciate I'm, snacks. I'm, I'm guess they are. They are snacks to defensive players, uh, defensive line. But breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Exactly. But you may get a guy that may not give you ten sacks, but he gives you six sacks, seven sacks, but he gives you double-digit pressures. Sometimes those pressures are just are more valuable or just as valuable as a sack. Why? Because now. I'm throwing a quarterback off rhythm. Mm-hmm. 
the quarterback doesn't have the time that he needs to have to go through his progressions. If I'm up in his face, it's like, oh, my goodness, I got to get rid of the ball. Possibly somewhere that I really don't want to throw it or really didn't anticipate no, I'm throwing it. I put pressure on you. You try to throw that slant now. Now that safety comes down and he jumps it, it's a pick the other way. So it's not just about the sex. I hope they're able to replace the ten and a half sacks that Danico Archery got us. Yes, yeah, sacks got still them important. last year. Yes, Mike Keith important. doesn't yell pressure. Yeah. He but, yells sack. <laughs> but if if I can generate pressure as well as get sacks, you know, ultimately, then that helps out the defense. Because now, if I go into a meeting room at the beginning of the week, first thing the head coach is going to put up there, this team gets pressure. They put pressure. It may not always equate the sacks, but the pressure that they put on quarterbacks is tremendous. So we got to get the ball out quick. But you still need to find someone that can do yeah, that. Yeah, you still get. And, 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 like Denard and, Wilson, I'm excited about, and I think uh -huh. that he's a good coach, but I'll say the same thing about him that I said about Bill Callahan. Mm -hmm. He's not a magician. No. And he can't wave his magic wand, and all of a sudden, Otis Reese turns into the next Aaron Donald. Mm -hmm. But I, I think if you put guys in positions to succeed, then – they're more than you will see a uptick in their play. That's why I said you don't need marquee players to get marquee play. You know, that player wasn't a marquee player until he started making plays. Then he became this all world player or this pro bowl, or all pro player. But before then, it was like, OK, I hope and I hope he becomes what we think he can. This team is in that sort of mode because they're going to get the opportunity with the new defensive coordinator. Jeffrey Simmons and now Harold Landry, a year, two years removed from that ACL, you saw how he looked at the end of the season. Just think how he's going to look under um, under um, Denard Wilson. This is going to be an aggressive, discipline, in-your-face defense, and it's going to allow those guys to 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 work best in in in, in sort of the, the the space they feel is is good for them, mm -hmm. whether it's you know, you may see an uptick with Denise, I mean, uh, um, um, Harold Landry. You may see an uptick in Jeffrey Simmons. You may see an uptick in Aaron Key. All these guys, because the defense has changed, is going to be, I think, a little bit more aggressive, but not too aggressive to a point where I'm exposing. But now they feel they have two good corners. So now they don't have to – you know how many times they had to protect those guys on the back end last year? Mm -hmm. A lot. In their minds, they don't have to protect these two corners as much. You know what happens then? Now we can rush the passer. Now these guys that maybe had two or three sacks last year, they got six or seven sacks. Why? Because now we can play on the back end what we really want to play. They do got to add a safety now. I yeah. think they got to add another safety. But the way that they look, McQuarrie, Sneed, uh, Chidobe, they have a solid, a, a solid, a good secondary. It can be even better if they add safety and how um, McQuarrie shows up in his third year. If he shows up and become one of the best nickelbacks, you got a secondary that can rival any, any secondary in the National Football League. And I also think secondaries are made better by a really good pass rush. Yeah, it does. Because if you get to the quarterback, hey, they're yeah. sitting back there saying, my job's done. Hey, but they got to the quarterback last year. And they got exposed in the back end. They got to the – I mean, you need both. Yeah. You, you need, need both. both. So. But now I think the Titans are in a position – look, you take care of the secondary. And that was absolutely a position group that needed to be taken care of. I say secondary. I'll say cornerbacks. Yeah. Because you still – like you said, you still need to address the safety position. Mm -hmm. That Amani Hooker is not going to be – you know, or Elijah Molden. Mm -hmm. you can't, I don't think that you can go into the season with just those two in that safety room. The defensive line needs some attention. Mm -hmm. The defensive line needs some love. And now that it feels like this first wave of free agency is behind us, and we'll probably approach the second wave of free agency here very shortly, are the Titans now in a position where we should start taking a look at and considering a defensive player in the first round of the draft? We'll get into that coming up next. We'll get into your thoughts as well. Tim Hasselbeck will join us in 45 minutes. Caroline Willie D. Mace. Hey, tune into 94.9 The Fan today as Vanderbilt Baseball takes on Valparaiso with the pregame at 545 and first pitch at 6 p.m. Vanderbilt Baseball brought to you by Smoky Mountain Tops, your countertop experts. Visit SmokyMountainTops.com.
Willie D. Mays. We're broadcasting from the Spring Hill Heating and Cooling Game Nashville Studios, keeping your home feeling comfortable all year round. And today, the studio is Barrel House at Bridgestone Arena because the Predators take on the Vegas Golden Knights. Big one tonight. Willie Donick joins the program. Willie D., how we doing? Hey, guys. Uh-oh, your mic's not uh, on. Ah, Willie's mic not on. Man, oh, man. We're silencing Willie. Yes. All right, now it should work. Okay, All there, right, we, there go. we go. Willie. I'm doing well, guys. I'm doing well. Good to be back in the Bridgestone Arena. Mm -hmm. And a big game tonight with the champions coming into town here. It is a big one tonight. Demons yeah. was saying earlier, sick and tired of everybody saying it's yeah, a big game. Willie, I'm sick and tired of that. I, but I yeah. do understand, like I, like I told Caroline, <laughs> uh, because she did sort of, you know, sort of spell it out why she believes it's a big game. I think okay. it's a biggie. Yeah. Uh, but I understand what she was saying from a point stamp, uh, from a points standpoint. Um, this is a big game because you want to try to keep that distance between you and Vegas. But to me, whether you're in the first or the second, you're still going to make the playoffs. Right. Um, this team, to me, has proven that they can uh, beat the big boys. They've proven it. Yeah. It wasn't a fluke. Uh, it wasn't, oh, they won because of a lucky goal. No. They've proven that they can beat the big boys. So, to me, whether they win or lose, I want them to win tonight. I want them to at least get a point. But whether they get a point, two points, or no points, it's not going to change how I feel about this team. This is a damn good team. And they've shown it. I said to, you know, to start a habit or to break a habit, what is it, 21 days, doing something for 21 days, and you essentially you either – you know, do what you want to do, become that person you want to become or closer to it or, you know, those habits that you have, you're able to break them after 21 days if you choose not to do it for 21 days. This team has proven this is this is who they are. Mm. They've been doing this over 21 days, Willie. This is who they are. They're a good team, Willie. I think they believe that. I, I think they believe that for sure. Oh, it's, it's no, they are. And I think you're just you just want to stay in that – Moment, you want to stay in the, <laughs> the driving forward, <laughs> seeing how you. I mean, this is the defending champs yeah, playing tonight. It's so Willie, they've already beaten yeah. them once. Yeah, they have. Yes, yeah, yeah. see, should we ask them the question or not? What's the question? We'll do ask that coming yeah, up we'll next. We'll do that later. Oh. We will do that coming up next because we started off the show by saying, I said, I have a question for D Mays, and it's a question that I know Willie's going to hate, and we're yeah. going to ask him oh. anyway. So we will ask that question is this Coach coming Willie? up. Coach Willie's really not going to like this, this question. This is Coach Willie. Exactly. exactly. This <laughs> question is not even in Coach Willie's vocabulary. No, it's not. Uh uh. Yeah, you, go, you might just walk out for a second. You might walk out for a second. Go yeah. full yeah. on coach night, throw your chair across barrel house. So we'll the get, anniversary of that was not far long ago. They, it wasn't? The, the, the chair throw, yeah, oh, it popped wow. up on that. this day in sports, whatever. They had that video. That is one of the all time greats. I'm sure that's, uh, yeah. that's a day that a lot of people have not forgotten. <laughs> no, the day that forget. lives in infamy. Especially the red. That day. Yeah. Throwing a chair. We oh, always yeah, remember that. Awesome. We will always remember that. Yes. And we will ask Willie the question that we all know that he's going to hate, but we're going to do it anyway. Okay. We're going to do that coming up next. Caroline, Willie, D. Mays. Hey, tune in to 102.5 and 106.3 The Game this week for NCAA tournament coverage brought to you by Toyota. Ready, set, go get your Toyota today at toyota.com.
Caroline, Willie, D. Mace, 1025-1063, The Game and The Game Nashville app. We are streaming live on Twitch, Twitter, YouTube, and Facebook Live every single day. And we're live out here at Barrel House at Bridgestone Arena. The Predators hosting the Vegas Golden Knights tonight. The reigning Stanley Cup champions in the building. Cup drop. Puck drop. Cup drop. Cup Don't drop. You can drop, drop your you cups. You can drop your cup. It's yeah. okay. <laughs> Don't drop your cups, but drop your pucks, yeah. and the puck will be dropped at 7 o'clock. Uh, Pre-game coverage starting at 6 p.m. on 102.5 and 106.3, the game. And speaking of the Predators, d and I were talking about this earlier. Mm -hmm. Predators haven't lost in regulation since February 15th. 17-game point streak. Yep. Eight-game win streak. This is true. Willie, this is a question that we know you're going to hate. <laughs> it goes against every single bone in Willie Donick's body, Coach but Willie. I have to ask you, Willie, are the Predators Stanley Cup contenders? Um, yes. <laughs> I, 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 th I think they, they were like, okay, we like to read the odds sometimes. <laughs> Jimmy See Shapiro's. <laughs> Our buddy Jimmy will send us odds eventually, right, about the uh -huh. odds. You will not see them among the favorites. Okay. But I think they believe that if they play the way they are playing, mm -hmm. that they can play with anybody. Like, they, they are probably going to play the way it is shaping up, mm -hmm. one of three teams. And it's hard, to, and you cannot tell which one it's going to be because it's mm -hmm. interchanging. They're all very, very even in the points. And it depends on if Nashville finishes in wild card one or wild card two. Mm -hmm. But it is very likely going to be Vancouver, Dallas, or Colorado. Now, those three are going to be among the, the teams that people will start listing when you hear the national pundits say, who are the Stanley Cup favorites? You are going to hear Colorado. Mm -hmm. You are going to hear Dallas. And you're going to hear Vancouver. You know, Vancouver, before the season started, would not have been in that category. They've just had a tremendous year yeah. under Rick Tockett. They've, they have been awesome out of the gate, and they have sustained it. Another Jack Adams candidate. I would say the favorite for the Jack yeah. Adams to win it. I, I would really be I, – I shouldn't say really disappointed. I will be disappointed if Andrew Burnett is not a finalist mm -hmm. for that. I but, would agree. But yeah. I can't argue with anybody that says Tockett because they, they were not supposed to be great, and mm – -hmm. They're, they are. They, they almost were the first team to clinch la last night. They missed their chance. They lost to the Kings last night. So are they contenders? They're going to be um, among the biggest underdogs, but the gap has, has constricted mm -hmm. a lot. I, I am really curious where Jimmy Shapiro and the, all the odds makers have them mm -hmm. because the last time the Predators were in the playoffs, when UC Saros got hurt right before – they went into the playoffs, mm -hmm. and they had to play Colorado, who was an unbelievable machine going in. They were like the biggest underdog in the playoffs for years. Yeah. Like they, nobody had been as big of an underdog, and it was, and it was for obvious reasons, and it didn't work out well. This year, I just don't think. Now, let's hope that you can have this caliber of a team, right, or this, this group of players, mm -hmm. right? There's, there are signs saying uh, tonight that Jeremy Lausanne – has a chance to come back and play. Like, th these are all things that you hope mm -hmm. that you have your team. Because crazy stuff happens. Like, that injury to UC Soros right before, that changed everything mm -hmm. for, th for that team. Mm -hmm. They still would have been a big underdog, but having him would have given you a shot. But the way they're going, um, I think they will believe that they could stack up with anybody that they play. Just looking at the odds, Predators are plus 4,000 to win the Stanley Cup. But just to kind of put that into perspective, Florida has the best odds at 650. Then Colorado, Carolina, Edmonton, Dallas, Boston, New York, Winnipeg, Vegas, Toronto, Vancouver, the Kings, Tampa Bay, and then the Predators. Wow. So they're right up there with all of the teams that I think very well could be listed as mm -hmm. serious contenders for the Cup. Vancouver is a little lower than, than I would have imagined. I think Plus that's because that's probably because of where they – a lot of people think they have overachieved a lot mm -hmm. and statistically overachieved, mm -hmm. too. Um, I wonder what the odds were before the season started. That would be an interesting thing to compare. Or even what it was yeah. like two months ago. Like I, uh, Those odds are interesting. That, that still has Nashville kind of on the bottom of, of the teams that are in. But I feel like in the locker room, they're starting to really believe that if they play the way they've been playing – that they'll have a chance against anybody. They won't look at themselves as this 
you know, Cinderella or whatever. You know what I mean? They, they, I think you want to embrace that mm-hmm. outwardly. You want, to, you want to be the team that's loose. Like, think about Vancouver. If it's Vancouver, mm-hmm. in that city, in that country, no Canadian team has won the Stanley Cup since 1993. That's oh, crazy. Wow. In Canada now. I mean, we're talking every game is Monday Night Football up there. Yeah. Right? If a Canadian team is playing, that's where everybody is looking in that, in that city. They'll be under the microscope. And they will be expected to beat Nashville. It's like we were talking about Tennessee fans, basketball. They don't want to hear about how good Creighton is. They just want to say, it's time to get past the Sweet 16. I don't care who you're playing. You have to get past the Sweet 16. I think that's kind of the mentality. uh, that, And that's where I think you could be in the beneficial position if you're Nashville. It's like, hey, we're we're not supposed to be here. You guys are the number one seed. Uh, We're not supposed to win. Let's be loose. Let's be the underdog. But inwardly, you're going to say, we, we could stack up with these guys. We've beaten these guys. And why wouldn't they feel yeah. that way? Yeah. They yeah. have beaten some of the best yeah. teams in the league. The only one they haven't beaten is Vancouver. And that was mm-hmm. three, three times early in the season before Nashville became the team that we mm-hmm. know them to be now. Yeah, they're, they're, they're a much different team um, than what they were, you know, the first half of the season. And, you know, I, I explained it, Willie, um, to Caroline um, this way. Um, you know, I, I think they've always thought, you know, when you change a new head coach, when you change head coaches, which means you're changing a coaching staff, you got a new GM in. Uh, his philosophy is a little bit different from the past G- GM. Um, the core of it is probably the same, but some things he wants to do is a little bit different. Um, there's going to be sort of this figuring out stage, you know, uh, introductory stage um, to what Coach Bruno wants to do. And he has to figure his players out. Yeah, he's watched these players from afar. Probably had, he had a game plan for them. But game planning for them and watching them from afar is nothing like actually being in the locker room with them, knowing their strength, their weaknesses, knowing which line to put them on, how do they sort of react to certain players. He was trying to figure all of this out in the first half of the season, as were the players. Mm-hmm. They finally got the right formula. They, to me – They're the team right now who they thought they were going to ultimately be at the beginning of the season. It took them them a little time to get there. Now they're there. They've proven that this is the type of hockey they're going to continue to play, whether they win or lose. The brand of hockey that they play is, is a brand which they can win with moving forward, not just today but tomorrow and next year or whatnot. So now they've reached that point, Willie, that, okay, we feel comfortable with what we're doing. We know exactly, you know where you're supposed to be. I know what to expect from you. You know what to expect from me. The coach know what to expect from all of us. So we can't go out on the ice anymore and play Mm half-ass. We got to go and do the things that we've been doing over the last month and a half. They figured it out now. They've learned. And now I think you're seeing the, 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 the Predator team, barring injury, you're seeing the Predator team that I believe they're going to be in the future, even in the future. I think they're only going to get better moving forward to me. And I, I, I really hope you're right. I still think if you line up talent-wise, they, mm-hmm. they still – I think what's exciting is what's in Milwaukee. Mm-hmm. That can really help even bolster it a little bit more from where they are now. But as far as what you were saying, the, the leadership and the belief in their formula, mm-hmm. like this is how we play, if we do this – I don't care where we're playing. I don't care who we're playing, mm-hmm. but we can stack up. This is a great test tonight against the champions. The, and then you've got Arizona. You know, this, these, like Andrew Britt has been saying, every game has got the test, right? You have to Arizona's stay. a test in and of itself, right. even you it's, have if to, it's an underachieving Because you're playing team. in a college it's a rank. Test. It's a mental test. And then Colorado at Colorado. Mm-hmm. And Colorado could be your first-round opponent. Now, the ultimate test to see if your formula stacks up is when you play Colorado at Colorado. They're 28-6. and six. I watched their game on Sunday. They were down 4 nothing against Pittsburgh. Mm-hmm. Looked like it was over. It wasn't over. They come <laughs> flying back. And, and by the end of the game, Pittsburgh was swimming around going, can we survive? Can we even just get this game to overtime? They barely did, and then they lost right at the beginning of overtime. They, just, they can overwhelm you in that building. High altitude. They get the matchups. So I, I'm really curious to see how their stuff stacks up in that building because that could be your first-round opponent. They will have the home ice advantage, 
right? So somewhere in there you got to get a win mm-hmm. in Denver, and that's been – there's you know, you're looking around the league, that's the toughest place to win in the league by definition, 28-6. 20, and six. Mm-hmm. Okay, here's another question for you, Willie, and, and this goes for you as well, Caroline. And, again, I'm, I'm thinking ahead. They get the win tonight, or they get a point. Let's just say they get a point out of this. But they have 10 games remaining, right? Right. When, when is that point where you say, okay, this is where we are. This is where we are at as a team, standing-wise. Now I need to give some guys some rest because this playoff push is going to be a, a tough. We need every – we need yeah. all, all, yeah. all sticks on deck. Right. You know what I'm you saying? Need we depth, need all hockey need, sticks on deck. You need players. Exactly. Yeah. So when is it? When is the time that coach you think Coach Bruno will say, okay, is it the last game, last two games, somewhere around there, to give my guys a – we already know where we're going to be. Yeah. Whether it's the first spot or the second spot. And I, I said to Caroline, they still got an opportunity to catch Winnipeg, you know. That's another thing is, you know, how, that might figure into exactly. your answer to uh-huh. that is, are you creeping up? But look. If you if you catch Winnipeg, uh-huh. you still play Dallas or Colorado yeah. in the yeah. first round. So it really don't matter. So you're going to get one of these really good teams mm-hmm. who will be on the top of that contender list mm-hmm. in the first round. No matter whether you're wild card one, wild card two, or you sneak into third place. Yes. Um, so I, that's a great question. I, the the one thing that I would look at in the two wild card spots is the travel. Mm-hmm. If you're traveling to Vancouver and then you have to let's say your second-round opponent is L.A. or Edmonton, uh-huh. that's a lot of miles in the air. And so if there is a way to – if you're splitting hairs, uh-huh. maybe you'd rather be in the central bracket. <laughs> but, hey. They're all going to be good teams. They're yeah. all going to be good teams. But you're talking but about from tra- a travel. From a travel yeah. and a wear and tear, yo-yoing uh-huh. back and forth. Mm-hmm. There was a year – the year before they went to the finals mm-hmm. – in 2017, they made the playoffs in 2016. They beat Anaheim in a tough first-round series. Mm-hmm. It went seven. So that's three trips to Anaheim. They won three games out of four mm-hmm. against the Ducks out there. Won the seventh game. They had never won a seventh game. Their next opponent was San Jose, oh, who ended up yeah. going all the way to the final, and they lost in seven games to San Jose. But that's a lot of trips from Nashville to California, yeah. back and forth. And they couldn't, ultimately, could not win in San Jose. They lost all four of the games out there. Now, San Jose had to travel to Nashville, but San Jose's first round, because that's the bracket out there, mm-hmm. they, they didn't have to travel in that first round, right? They were playing, I think, L.A. or somebody like that. A little less wear and tear. So that's one thing to think about. But your question, the mm-hmm. Coach Willie cringing question of are you contenders, I think you can make the case that anybody who makes the playoffs mm-hmm. is a contender. You're well, a contender. To a well, certain you would agree. Like, would you, would you, you have know. thought the Florida Panthers were a contender yeah. last year? And last lost, year? Yeah, oh, excuse me. No, last I did year. not. And then they beat Boston in the first round, and I thought, goodness gracious. But I'll say the Predators in 2022, when they barely snuck into the no. playoffs and got swept by Colorado, they were not a contender. They were not a no, contender. No, no, no. And, and for obvious reasons. Right? When Soros was out, that, that ended that. Yeah. And they still would have been a huge underdog with Soros. Mm-hmm. I would contend if Soros didn't get hurt, they would have played. Calgary, that would have been a, a way different matchup. They, they would have had a much better chance of pulling that one off. The, on the flip side, too, all of these, quote, contenders, let's just say it is Dallas and Winnipeg mm-hmm. in the first round. Those are two Stanley Cup contenders. Mm-hmm. One of them's out in the first round. Yeah. And the all summer, you guys can't get by the first round. You guys can't go, why, why can't you get past the first round? Well, they played another Stanley Cup contender. That, that's it, it is part of the part of the the journey. It is so hard to win that first round. Vegas, right? They did all of these magical things with the with the salary cap. They added all these guys, and they will be likely a wild card. Maybe they sneak into second, mm-hmm. or maybe they sneak into third in the Pacific. Mm-hmm. So who are they going to play? Edmonton in the first round, or Vancouver mm-hmm. in the first round, or Dallas in the first round. They have a bear of a first round opponent. And you think these teams are sitting there going, oh, wow, Vegas, they're sitting there in the, in the wild card. Are we going to play them in the first round? That's the defending champions right there. 
You got to play them in the first and round. And they get how many players back in the playoffs? Well, Miraculously, we, thanks to long term IR. We will see. We will see. They have some Mr. Miyagi's yeah. over there. That sure they're, seems not, to they're nursing some injuries right uh, up they, until they the get, night they before get the Mr. Miyagi. <laughs> they get them healed up. Uh huh. Yeah. <laughs> oh, you're miraculously <laughs> you're healed. You're okay. You're okay. <laughs> Couldn't play in game 82. They're ready to go in game 83. But it's all it matters. <laughs> I think they are because I think they're playing like one because yeah. they're beating Stanley Cup contenders. And this was the point I made to D-Mace earlier. They're beating good teams, and it's not by a fluky, weird goal or a weird call here and there, and you just squeaked by against a Colorado or a Dallas. No, no, no. Like, you are beating teams handedly, winning at Florida in their building three to nothing. Like, that is... That's not fluky stuff. And when you beat good teams, that means you are a good team. And I think if you're beating Stanley Cup contenders, the way that this team is playing and as consistently as they've been playing, as well as they've been playing, how much offense they're creating, as good of goaltenders, as good of goaltending as they are getting, why wouldn't you call them a Stanley Cup contender? And that's not to say that they're going to win the Stanley Cup. Mm -hmm. That just means that they can make things uncomfortable and make things very interesting for whoever they play in the first round of the playoffs. Uh, I, I would agree with that. And, and it's all it, once you get out of the first round, that's when it really opens up yeah. and really anything can happen. The other thing, the thing I would say, too, is the playoffs are different. Right, you mm -hmm. can sit there and say, "Well, we beat this team three times." You know, this feels season. like a different game entirely. Uh, it, it, it it is different yeah. in the playoffs. Uh, uh, D Mace, would you say in your, all of your NFL playoff games that the playoffs were different? Oh, definitely. The playoffs are uh, are much the mentality. I think you you know throughout the week it's the same because you always want to prepare the same way. Um, if you have to change your preparations, that means you didn't have good preparation habits. So if you have good preparation habits, you don't change anything you do throughout the week. But the actual game, the ramifications, it is different. It yeah. feels – when you step out on that field during the playoffs, it feels different. Like the minute you walk into that building, everything feels different. Your preparation is no different. But once you walk into that building on a Saturday or a Sunday, whenever you play in the playoffs, that does feel different. Yeah. The minute you get out your car. Now – for this Nashville team, remember it was billed as a young team. Let's let's see where the young guys take us and everything. But if you look at their lineup there. now, yeah, they have a, especially with the additions of Zucker and Beauvillier, they do have a lineup that has a lot, a lot of playoff experience. If you look at this, is why they got them right. The quote: the serial winners, mm -hmm. Ryan O'Reilly, Cup, Luke Shen, Cups, Ryan McDonough. Cups, Philip Forsberg, Roman Yossi, a gazillion playoff games mm -hmm. for, this, for this franchise. Mm -hmm. Beauvillier, deep runs in the playoffs under mm -hmm. Barry Trotz. Jason Zucker, same. They, they've, they've played a lot of playoff games. So mm -hmm. that, I think, gives them a, another way of belief that we've been through this. Mm -hmm. We'll show you the way. The, the mm -hmm. young guys that are going to get in there, they will have the support uh, of the veterans. That's how they designed it. That's, again, why Barry Trotz has done a – a brilliant job with his vision of what he hoped this team could be. Want to get some of your thoughts on the Predators. 615-737-1025 is the phone number. Phone line driven by WilsonCountyHyundai.com. Jim in Nolansville is on the line with a question on the Predators. What's up, Jim? Yeah, I wanted to see, Willie, what you thought of uh, Parsimon. It seemed like he was promising uh, last year, and then this year it seemed like his uh, compete level was kind of declining. How did he do when he went down to Milwaukee? And uh, what do you think of his uh, future? Well, let's, it's a great question, by the way, because I think, I think Barry so. Trotz, part of this whole thing is, okay, I, this is where we're going right now, and uh, let's, let's, let's help these guys. Let's bring in Zucker. Let's bring in Beauvillier. But he can't forget about Parsonen mm -hmm. and Glass and Tomasino mm -hmm. and all of these guys that, you know, you gave a chance to, mm -hmm. right? These are still guys that you want. A part of the future. Down the road, yeah. yes, you need those guys. So what's happened in Milwaukee is interesting. They won 19 in a row. Everybody's like, oh, Milwaukee, 19 in a row, this is amazing. <laughs> I think they're 1-7, or you know, they're, they're, they've struggled a lot since then. But why? Well, Nashville's taken a few of their defensemen. Yeah. they got a couple other defensemen that are hurt. Uh, a scar off has cooled off a little bit, and all of a sudden, it's not going great. But I do think Parson and... Has, uh, Svechkov is also hurt, another one of their top prospects that mm -hmm. I think is part of the future too. 
Um, I think Parsonen would, let's just say you have the dream, yeah. right? You get into the, the, the playoffs and it's deep in the series. You get past the first round. And, hey, look, in two weeks you could lose a couple forwards and all of a sudden you're calling up guys like Parsonen or Tomasino. This might be a good thing, though, for Parsonen. Right to go down, get the confidence back. He's had some big games. I, I don't. He was a big part of the 19 game winning streak for uh-huh. sure. So he's played well down there. Um, he's still really young. So I don't think it's the last time we're we're, we're hearing from Parson. And same thing with Tomasino and some of the other guys that we haven't seen in Nashville yet. But I think that's the that's what Barry Trotz has to keep his eye on. One eye on the team. One eye on. Where, where am I in the big picture? And those are interesting off-season discussions as well. Oh, no question. I think we're at the point where you just rock with what's working. Yeah. You know, yeah. Of course you want to balance the right now and the future, but right now the focus is right now. You're making the playoffs. You're trying to make a run here. In the off-season, it's now the delicate balance of, okay, what do we want to be next year? Because this, team, this is not a young team. Like you said, you have a lot of experience. You've got guys that have been around in the league for several years on this team. Next season, what's the focus? Do you want to get younger next season? Do you want to just run it back with a lot of these veterans? A, you have options. And You've got you have, options. You have the flexibility and the cap to do it as well. Yeah. Right? They, could, they, could go, they could go out and go get a big free agent. They have the money. Yeah, Robbie and Joe it. were talking Mitch Marner this morning. Now, that's big, big fish right there. <laughs> now, that's – I don't know. If, I cannot imagine that he hits the market, but – you could go shopping yeah. for some expensive free or, or for one. Probably you don't need five, but you could you could pull your resources and say, let's go get one big guy mm-hmm. that could help us. You you have that option. You have the option, like you said, of let's keep with the big picture. Let's let the young guys come in, and then you got a guy like Zucker, like Zucker, who knows Andrew Burnett well, knows the system. He looks like he's a good fit. He's he's a rental, but. Maybe you like him. Maybe you want yeah. to keep him for the right price next year. Though these are all ways you can go. It's just like with the UC Saros thing. Which way do you want to go? You want to resign him? Yeah, I do. But if I can't, if he's asking for too much, I could look the other way and say, well, we got we got a scar off. We got Lankin. You know, there's options. And that conversation just got much more interesting than maybe the conversations we were having about a month ago. And what would really be interesting if Saros goes on a postseason run, which we uh-huh. can see goalies do, all of a sudden, that ups his Price stock. Goes up. But that also makes you want to say, we got to keep him! Yeah. <laughs> he just took us to the... Whatever, you know? Just won the Stanley Cup so, with him! Right. Exactly. You can say it, Willie. We can dream. We can dream. We can dream. He just hey, won us the Stanley Carolina. Cup. Cup. Carolina remembers the 2019 Cup. Blues, right? Were they, were they a Cup contender? No, they were Not in, They were the last place in the league yeah. in January, but by the end of the year, they were playing great, and then they just mowed everybody down. And the next thing you know, they're singing Gloria throughout the streets, and they got the rings. It's a fun they got summer. the cup. Yeah. I do. I always caution anyone who brings up that team, though, because that 2019 Blues team, that is the exception and not the rule. I mean, Bennington was a fine goaltender. They got super, super hot. Like, give me sorrows over Bennington any day of the week and twice on Sundays. But I, I always try to caution. I know it happened. I know it could happen again. But yeah. that was a Cinderella. Like, that was a fairy tale. That doesn't happen every single but, year. But some would say that the Predators in 2017 were a l- had a little bit uh-huh. of that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Last year's Panthers team had a little bit of that. There, there's, there are more Cinderellas in the NHL mm-hmm. playoffs, I think, than. It is March. Yeah. Yeah. It is. March is for Cinderella's. Yep. All right, 615-737-1025 is the phone number. We'll get into your thoughts on that. But coming up next, Tim Hasselbeck, ESPN NFL analyst, will join us. want to get Tim's thoughts on the luxurious Sneed trade, and we'll do that coming up next. Caroline Willie D. Mays, we're brought to you by Zen Sports. Start earning cash rewards on your bets today. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-889-9789. Terms and conditions apply. Must be 21 or older and in Tennessee to bet. time to talk Lone Pronto. Remember the formula. It's working well for a lot of people. We just talked about the Predators formula. Well, Lone Pronto's formula is if you live in our listening area, chances are you 
have a house that value is up. And you can use that to your advantage by getting money out of your home's equity to address other financial needs. Maybe you just got, a, got some bills to pay and you're looking for a way to do it. Maybe you got some kids in college and you got some big tuition payments coming up. Maybe you want to start a home improvement project at your home. Well, all of these things can be done by going through Loan Pronto and their Express Equity line of credit program. They can make it happen and they can make it happen fast. It's pain free. You can do it without all kinds of paperwork and stuff like that. It doesn't take very long. So all of a sudden, you can have that engine driving you towards that next level of financial success you're looking for. So call Loan Pronto. Approval is just minutes away. 615-499-5780. That's 615-499-5780. Or go to LoanPronto.com. NMLS 166-1781, subject to lender approval, equal housing lender.
Caroline, Willie, D. Mays. We're broadcasting from the Spring Hill Heating and Cooling Game Nashville Studios, which today is Barrel House at Bridgestone Arena because the Predators take on the Vegas Golden Knights tonight at 7 p.m. And that music can only mean one thing. That means Tim Hasselbeck, ESPN NFL analyst and Ensworth head football coach, joins us now. Tim, appreciate you for joining us. The Titans trade a 2025 third and swap seventh round picks with the Kansas City Chiefs for luxurious need. Are you surprised by the trade compensation? And why was the asking price so low, in your opinion? I am surprised. Um, I think when we talked last week, uh, you know, when I, I was maybe trying to forecast it, I had it, um, I think, a, at a richer price tag. That's a good thing for the Titans. And, you know, my guess is, you know, the Titans, um, you know, had to sign them to a big contract, right? I mean, like that's the, you know, the presumption on it. And so and I think that probably a general feeling that Kansas City knew that they weren't going to extend him or be able to, to get him under contract. And so with that, um, you know, the tag was really only used in order to be able to get something uh, of value rather than letting them walk in free agency and ended up with some type of compensatory pick. So um, I think it's a good thing for the Titans. I think they've added a really good player. And, um, and I think Kansas City maybe just with the situation they were in with Chris Jones and LeJarius Neat you know, felt like that was the best, you know, thing to do considering you had two really good players that were due contracts. And if I'm the Chiefs, they could look at it like I got Patrick Mahomes and Chris Jones and as long and Travis Kelsey, as long as I've got those three players, you know, traded weight Tyree Kill still won a Super Bowl, so that could be mm-hmm. Kansas City's mentality. But just how good is Legereus Sneed? How much of a difference maker can he be for this Titans defense? Yeah, I, I think he's a really good player. I think he's, you know, when you when you think about matchups, it's a matchup league. Uh, he's a guy that um, matches up well with, you know, an opposing team's, you know, star receiver. I think he's also a guy that uh, has good zone skills uh, as well as good man skills. And so, look, uh, you know, playing defensive back in the National Football League is hard. You know, the rules are set up so that offenses have success. You know, you can only tackle guys a certain way. They're, you know, it's just it's a difficult position to play, um, and it's hard to play it at a high level for a long period of time. And so, uh, you know, what I, I guess the, the big thing would be to say, did the Titans get better in the secondary with this trade? And I think you can – absolutely say yes and so i i think that what does he bring i mean he brings um you know more experience and probably better play and ability and confidence to the secondary which um i think is probably wanted and needed with some recent recent departures as well as uh, you know guys that have been drafted that just really haven't worked out We'll talk with Tim Hasselbeck, ESPN NFL analyst and head football coach at the Innsworth Tigers, with the Innsworth Tigers. Now, Tim, are you, because it seemed like, you know, when this, this whole thing first started uh, with LeJarrius Sneed, um, there was no sort of red flags. It was just, okay, are they going to tag him or are they going to tag Chris Jones? Who are they going to tag first? Well, obviously they tag uh, LeJarrius Sneed, signed Chris um they signed a big defensive tackle, uh, Chris Jones. Uh, but then all of a sudden you started to hear, well, he didn't practice much because of injury. Um, they didn't say he missed a bunch of games. They, it just started coming out, well, he hadn't practiced much. Are you concerned about that, or would you be concerned about that moving forward? Because to me, it wasn't a problem when you tagged him. It wasn't a problem last year, but all, all of a sudden now yeah. – this is starting to leak out that, oh, he didn't practice. I can tell you there's probably half of the NFL that didn't practice for one reason or another, and a lot of it had to do with probably nagging injuries throughout the season. Yeah, I think that this is how this typically works. When you're going to guarantee that type of money, when you're going to uh, make a significant trade, um, you're going to gather as much information as you can. And – Part like I, I'll just give you a good example. I remember when Anquan Bolden was headed to free agency, and I can't even remember what team I was. Actually, I, I don't even think I was on a team uh, anymore. I think I was in TV. In fact, I know I was. I was in TV, and I got a phone call from a team 
that was interested in signing Anquan Bolden as he was leaving Arizona. So somebody called me and said, hey, from my former team, uh, one of my former teams, like, like, tell me about, like, him practicing and stuff. And people remember Anquan, he was a really tough player. Like, he you know, played with a broken jaw. He played with, you know, a, a broken foot. He had a dislocated toe one time, and they had to, you know, hide his pads in the locker room because he wanted to play, and, and you know, the, the team didn't want him to because they thought he would re-injure himself. And so, you know, he didn't practice a lot because he was, he was really banged up. But it wasn't because he didn't want to practice. I say all that to say that, like, you better be gathering that information. Mm-hmm. And, and I would think that in today's world with, you know, the experience that Rand has, the, the resources that you have to find out a player's practice habits, a player's health, all of that stuff is going to get checked out prior to, you know, a, a trade of any type of magnitude being made. So, excuse me, in terms of, like, things coming out after the fact, look, sometimes it is just trying to appease the fan base in Kansas City that maybe is unhappy with the fact that they lost a good player, they didn't love the draft compensation. Truthfully, I, I think that um, – I think if you're sitting here as a Tennessee Titans fan, I think you should be happy about the trade. You should not be worried about the practice participation and the luxurious need. Yeah, that's what I I, I was kind of thinking, Tim. I'm, uh, I looked at it from the standpoint, you know how many guys either are held out during the week or possibly can practice, but the coach said, hey, listen, sit back, you know, and, and take a few days off. As long as you can practice Thursday and Friday, we're good. Um, that happens more times than not in the NFL, especially now with so much money involved. Um, so, I mean, I'm not too concerned about it, but I know when you're play, paying that much money, you want to make sure you cross every T and dot every I, so I can understand from that standpoint. Um, another thing I want to ask you about, Tim, is the new rule, the new kickoff rule. Mm-hmm. And we will talk about this as a whole uh, on the show um, afterwards, but are you in favor of this new rule and why implement this rule Uh, when, you know, it seems like, you know, concussions and everything else has dropped um, Mm -hmm. in in regards to kickoff return. You're still going to have it because it's a high-impact play, but to change it that drastically, it it, it does – I'm not going to say it it sort of takes away, but it does change as far as you you scheming and game planning for your particular kickoff and kickoff return. Yeah, I think it's a massive change. It's it's a huge rule change. Mm-hmm. Now, I will say this, you know, I think we, you know, I think we sometimes, you know, argue against the National Football League and like, do you really care about player safety? You're adding more regular season games. Do you really care about it? You know, like that type of stuff. This 100% is a player safety, mm-hmm. longevity of the game decision. The NFL studied it. They know that uh, kickoff and kickoff return, uh, you know, the kickoff play in general is, you know, leads to more concussions disproportionately than any other play in the game. And that's why, if you just think about the changes, like shoot, go back to when my dad played, you used to be able to cut on kickoff return, got rid of that. Then, you know, you had wedges, they got rid of the wedges. Then they got rid of, you know, the running starts from 10 yards deep for the kickoff team. They've, you know, adjusted where the ball goes on a touchback. There have been kind of little modifications along the way because the NFL knows that it's a really dangerous play and there are a lot of guys getting hurt and a lot of guys getting hurt with head injuries. And so this to me was, you know what, like let's stop inching to, to that point and let's just go ahead and rip the Band-Aid off and say we're making this change in the name of player safety um, because we need to do it. it there, there's disproportionate in terms of head injuries on this play. And so, look, that's what they're doing. I'm not going to be critical of the NFL when it's in the name of player safety and it's actually in the name of player safety. I'll be critical when you're like, hey, player safety, but let's play a few more games. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I think that um, I'm okay with it in that regard. And then I would say you're right about it's going to change the way we – we coach the game. The game is played. It's going to change who makes rosters because of the different skill set in terms of covering a kick in that regard, the value of a guy that can kick, kick touchbacks, if that's in fact what you want him to do since the ball will be placed on the 30. I, I think there are a lot of factors 
to this that are going to impact the game. It's going to take it adjusting and getting used to. Um, but I think ultimately less guys will get hurt and will have less head injuries. And that's what the NFL wants. And I think it's, I don't know. I just, I don't think that we should be critical of them for that. We're talking to Tim Hasselbeck, talking NFL. So Tim, the other one that I think we're all still trying to envision what impact this is going to be on the game, but I can certainly understand the outcry of defensive players saying, okay, you got all these rules that are making it easier for the offense, and now you've got this hip toss, whatever they call this thing, mm-hmm. where you can't drag the guy down. I've seen it happen a few times. Like I, You know it when you see it, mm-hmm. and everybody yeah. cringes. You can see guys getting the high ankle sprain. They're getting pulled down from behind awkwardly, and I don't want to see that. Mm-hmm. But at the same time, as a defender, I'm trying to figure out the technique change that you will have to make and the impact it's going to have. Because I can see a defender going, well, I've got to get the guy down on the ground. I, I mean, this is the yeah. only way I can do it. I'm not grabbing him by the face mask. I'm not taking his knees out. What do you want me to do? Yeah, I think it's a hard one. I mean, to me, this feels like, you know, it's, it's like this big extension of the horse collar tackle. Mm-hmm. And, um, look, the horse collar tackle, you know, you can see it. It's like directly behind. But this hip drop tackle that, that you're referring to, Sometimes it's on the side. Sometimes, you know, contact is originally be made, you know, head to head. Um, there are a number of plays where, yes, it is the defender coming from behind. But from a coaching perspective, I don't know what you do. I mean, I, you, you, if you're coming from behind, you, you know, you have to, you know, kind of just go for the guys, you know, go for the guys' legs to try to trip him up. I think this one's going to be a really difficult one to um, to coach to you know guys out of it because you know when we talk about like hey you can't hit a guy a defenseless receiver high as he's coming across the middle like you could say all right well the guy he needs to take you know change like his target area of where he wants to hit uh, that receiver that's coming across the middle I'm not saying it won't take some adjusting but you at least know what the coaching point can be. I'm not really sure what the coaching point is in terms of like, you're trying to tackle somebody like you're, you're behind him. You can't horse collar tackle. You've got to get him to the ground. And we're talking about big physical elite athletes that, you know, you like, it's not easy to get to the ground. So this one, I understand the outcry from defensive players. I'm curious to see what the coaching technique is in regards to like, like how do you actually get a player down as you're approaching him as a defender from behind in some of these situations? Yeah. Especially yeah, if you're, a, if you you're the it. slower guy. You lightly guy. touch him and yeah. you say, get down, yeah. please. Yeah, if you're the slower guy and you're trying to catch the guy from behind, I mean, it's, you're, you're, you're desperate. It's either that or score the touchdown. So you have to do what you have to do. So that you can't be thinking about, well, what's my technique here and how to, let's avoid the hip drop and – like, do, nobody thinks that way, right? I don't, I, I, I think the I don't even think the coaches know how to coach contact, that. A lot of times there's contact, and then you're just wrestling the guy down. Yeah. Right? And so, you know, I think there's an element of this where I think guys have been tackling that way for years. Mm-hmm. And if you would have asked them, like, what's your technique here? You know, they'd be like, well, listen, after I hit him and he didn't go down, I wrapped him up and just did everything I could to wrestle yeah. him to the ground. And this is just you know, in. The guy's like, still trying to run. He's still trying to gain yards, right? Yeah. He's got one yard yeah. to get to the sticks. It's third and nine. You've got to get him down. That's, that's tough. Just jump on his back. That's all. <laughs> just jump on his back, and hopefully he'll fall. You know, he may take you on a ride for about Say, three yards. No, stop. <laughs> because you can't knock him forward, right? Because if you're knocking him forward, he's going to make the sticks, right? You almost have to concede the first down. So you – Part of the reason it happens, right, you're pulling him back so he can't stretch out and get to the chains. Uh-huh. You're trying to stop the guy's momentum. There's yep. no question about it. And I think that, you know, it's like, uh, you know, if you're chasing somebody from behind, it's like you don't push him in the back to get him to fall forward, right? Like it's the right. same general concept. And a lot of times you'll see defensive backs run behind somebody and swing at their leg to basically get them to trip themselves, like if they're trying to catch somebody. But those are all very different tackles than, hey, listen, I'm, I'm catching somebody from behind, I'm jumping on his back, and I'm trying to wrestle him to the ground. 
It's it's what uh, we would call a conundrum. Yeah. For a, a defensive <laughs> player or a quandary. I feel for you're, defensive. You're players. in a quandary. What do you do? I, I don't know what you do. <laughs> I mean, play yeah. offense. Tell your coach, I'm not playing defense. Yeah. I'm playing hey, offense. Hey, Score hey, more Tim, points. <laughs> Tim, how are you going to coach your players? <laughs> yeah, how are you going to coach, your, coach. Your, your high school yeah, players? Coach. Uh, who's going to be the, the, the practice dummy to get, you hey, know? Here's the here, – here, I mean, and I mean this. This is an interesting – I have actually was thinking about the kickoff rule, um, you know, and as that relates. Because, you know, one of the things we do see is that, you know, uh, like there's some trickle-up stuff – in football, you know, from high school to college, college to the pros. And then there's obviously trickle down things as well in terms of rules and player safety. And you just think about something like the guardian caps, right? Like no one wanted to wear guardian caps and then the NFL is wearing them. And, you know, you go around high school, there, there are some teams that play games in guardian caps. And so, um, look, I, I think one of the things that I think it's important for coaches of all levels, and I certainly fit into this now, Look, I'm going to be eager to see the way that um, people coach it, you know, especially at the pro level, which where we'll see it, and no differently than than the kickoff. It, it's why you know the way Pete Carroll had been coaching tackling in Seattle, and you know the NFL puts together a, a USA Football you know video of this is you know how the Seattle Seahawks tackle it should be good enough for you know, you to tackle this way at your high school program or your college program. And so people are studying it, trying to learn it. And yeah, that'll be no different for me or a bunch of other guys that are coaching high school football or college footballs to see what the reaction to this in the NFL is, how it's coached. And, you know, if you can implement that at the level where you're coaching. Last one for you, Tim, quickly. It feels like we can say the first wave of free agency is behind us. Of course, we still have Mm -hmm. the draft and the next few waves of free agency. But now that this first wave is behind us, what's kind of the national perception of the additions that the Titans made in free agency? I think it's good. I think nationally, um, what's had everyone's attention is it feels like the Cowboys have done nothing, right? Like that's what's grabbing everyone's attention. Classic. And then, um, and, and I think that, I think people feel like, yeah, like the Titans have done good things. I think the big thing in terms of the challenge of what the perception is, is you look at the AFC, it's loaded with quarterbacks, it's loaded with good football teams. And so, you know, like whether it is, um, you know, adding star defensive players or guys on the offensive side of the ball, ultimately I think that that everyone's going to still be in a wait and see in terms of how the quarterback plays. I, I, I think it – is that simple, right? Like Tony Pollard, great. Jerry Sneed, great. Um, you know, but what's your quarterback going to do? And um, look, I think that that's fair, especially when you play uh, in a division that's got C.J. Stroud and Trevor Lawrence, and when you and Anthony Richardson for that matter, we're still waiting to see on. And and when you have a conference with Patrick Mahomes and Lamar Jackson and Joe Burrow and and players like that. It's it's a quarterback league. Yep. It's totally fair. I don't think Kansas City's shaking in their boots about who's playing corner because they know who's playing quarterback. Exactly. Tim, you are the very best. Appreciate your time, and thanks for joining us, and we'll catch up with you next week. Great. Thanks, guys. See you. Yep. All right. Appreciate it. Tim Hasselbeck, appreciate him for stopping by. We'll react to what Tim had to say there coming up next, plus your thoughts as well. 615-737-1025 is our phone number. Caroline Willie D. Mace. And hey, score big this spring with Lee Company and the Nashville Predators in the 10K Power Play giveaway. Enter for a chance to win a Kohler home generator or $10,000 toward Lee Company Home Services. That's right, a Kohler home generator or $10,000 toward Lee Company Home Services. Go online to leecompany.com slash giveaway to enter. That's leecompany.com slash giveaway in the 10K Power Play giveaway. Contest entries are accepted until Saturday, April 20th. Lee Company, all you need.
Well, Caroline just mentioned Lee Company, and I've got a little more on them. They are a huge sponsor of our Nashville Predators coverage, and you will see their display all around Smashville when you come see the defending champions tonight. The Vegas Golden Knights take on the Predators. Can Nashville get the streak to 18? Can they do it? It has been an amazing story. This is going to be an intense game tonight. Vegas got a big win last night in St. Louis, 2-1 to one in overtime. As far as Lee Company, you know what I like to recommend to all of you because we use it in our house, and that is the home maintenance plan. We get the annual checkups of our air conditioning system, our heating system, plumbing, and electric, and this is that time of year. Pretty soon you're going to need that air conditioning in your house every day. You know how it gets in the summer. Make sure it's running properly and efficiently. It's going to save you money if you get it checked. So call Lee Company, 615-567-1000, or go to LeeCompany.com. That's 615-567-1000, or go to LeeCompany.com. Lee Company, proud sponsor of Nashville Predators. Remember, LeeCompany.com. Caroline, Willie, Dean Mays for live out here at Barrel House at Bridgestone Arena. Predators in action against the Vegas Gold Knights tonight. And I'm glad that you brought up the rule changes with Tim. Yeah. Because I want to get into the kickoffs with you here in a second, Dean Mays, okay. because I don't think there's anybody better to comment on the kickoff changes than you are. But as far as the hip drop tackle is concerned, like Skylar Texan, phone lines driven by WilsonCountyHand.com, says, how do you chase another football player to tackle him without doing a hip drop, drop tackle? And at some point, are guys just going to let them run away when they run past guys? Like, I, I understand wanting to make uh -huh. the game safer, but also to a certain extent, like, how do you play football? I, I, I don't know how you uh, – because, it, you know, it previous changes – 
there's always been sort of a like an example like okay this is how you do this or if you don't want to go for the head this is how this is what targeting looks like mm -hmm. we can there's a clear distinct between tackling you know at a guy and, and your head up and targeting targeting usually you can tell targeting mm -hmm. when you see it um, so you can kind of coach your guys out of targeting I don't know how you coach your guys out of this particular tackle it's not like guys are running toward the, the you know the ball carrier and saying oh man I don't want to hip tackle him so I got to kind of torque my body like this mm -hmm. or you know make sure I'm in this position no it's hey I'm just trying to get the tackle on the ground I'm not trying to hurt him but just think Derrick Henry at 240 let's just say Ladarius Sneed at 180, and you're talking about him, him coming. Down. Yeah, how do you tackle Derrick Henry, you know, at an angle? Or how do you tackle if you're running from behind him? Do you try to just punch at the ball? Because more than likely you are running to, from yeah. behind him. Do you try to punch at the ball and try to slow him down so somebody else? But typically what you see is guys punching at the ball, and then they grab with their left hand, and they punch with the right mm -hmm. hand. And sometimes as you're trying to bring him down, it may cause you to sort of – hip drop that's not what you want to do but we're taught to get the ball from the player but make sure you also can tackle him as well so if I'm running up from a behind I'm putting my left hand over him and I'm trying to punch the ball out with my right hand it's going to cause me in a sense to hip drop because mm -hmm. if I don't get the ball I'm trying to grab him and bring him down I don't know how you coach out of that now they're going to listen they're going to come up with many ways and those ways ain't going to look no different from what they've been teaching how to tackle the last 20 years. It's not. But now they're going to put an emphasis on no hip drops. It's not like, again, the injury, the lower, the lower body injuries have not gone up. So why implement this rule? That's, that's what I wonder. What, what was the data? I, I'm sure it's out there. But it hasn't, but it and hasn't I, gone up. And I can up. think of anecdotally some examples uh -huh. of a guy gets hip dropped and he twists his ankle or, or you know, twists his knee uh -huh. or whatever. So I'm sure that's why. I remember vividly when they put the horse collar in. It was when you were playing. Uh -huh. Who was the kid from? Uh, uh, Calico. Tyrone Calico. Tyrone Calico. And it was uh, Roy Williams. Roy Williams from the Cowboys. Uh -huh. Grabbed him. And but that was a deliberate. That was like deliberate. He that, grabbed the back of his. And that's where yeah. I was going. Like that one, you could see if you could grab a guy in uh -huh. that area, the horse collar, that was an easy way to get a guy down. You can really rip him back. Yeah. Exactly. And, you know, that's. That's dangerous. Yeah, that, that here, yeah. I, I, it is dangerous, but it's not intentional. I, there's nobody intentionally trying to injure somebody when you tackle uh -huh. them like that. I don't think. No, it's I'm grabbing his waist and I'm trying to get him. Except down. for maybe an isolated situation, you've got a guy that's just getting carried yeah. away. There's always that, but the technique itself is just I've got to get the guy down, right? And it almost trying feels to keep like the guy from getting a first yeah. down or a touchdown. It feels like to me, could you look at it differently? That not every single hip drop tackle is a 15-yard penalty. No. That it's a That's case by case one. basis. But also, I don't think the NFL wants to open themselves up to interpretation. Mm -hmm. I think the NFL wants it to be black and white, allowed, not allowed. Yes, you can do this. No, you can't do this. I think they want to eliminate the gray areas. How many times do we complain about targeting calls? Yeah. More specifically at the college football level. Every time targeting is called, it's like, there we go again on the carousel of targeting. And I don't think the NFL wants to get themselves to that point. But it does seem this, like this reminds me of the, of the turf conversation. Uh -huh where it's like every injury that happened on turf, it was like, well, there's that pesky turf again. And it's like, was it the turf or did he get concussed because he got yeah. drilled in the head? And it really had nothing to do with the turf. I look at the hip drop tackle similarly of, yes, there were instances, unfortunate instances, in which players tore ACLs, had knee injuries, leg injuries from a hip drop tackle. Mm -hmm. But is it like a square and rectangle situation where not every hip drop tackle exactly. is dangerous, but some of them can be? Yes, but my thing is, is have you had more of these tackles that have caused injuries thus far? Did you have more last year than... And, I'm, when I and say the ones that do cause injury are exactly. going to be the ones that are at front, in the front of your mind because exactly. you think about the injuries and not the hip drop tackles that happen several times in exactly. a game that there don't could result have in been, injury. There could have been 15 hip drop tackles in a game, but then one caused an ankle sprain or a high ankle sprain. Mm -hmm. So how many hip toss 
tackles that resulted in injury did you have NFL? So much so that you had to change the rule. I know, and I understand you just want to be proactive. Yeah. I get it. You want to be proactive, but you got to be proactive from a from a standpoint of okay, we're going to be proactive, but we have a solution. Like, what is your solution? How do you so you? So who is demonstrating? Are refs demonstrating how to tackle? Hell no, because they ain't never tackle. Well, no. Terry Killens has, but most of them ain't never tackle. So how can you tell me what, what is legal and what is it? Well, they, they already do, to be fair. But no, 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 but no. I'm saying some things are black and white. Some things you know. Like targeting, I don't have to play. I know that it's targeting. Mm-hmm. Hip, hip drop, what is, what is deemed a hip drop and what is deemed not? And I think that the NFL should work with coaches of like, look, this is what the transition is going to be. This is what we want to emphasize. Is that going to be the case? Frankly, I don't know. I'm all for making the game safer, but it's just, well, how do it. you enforce it? Yeah. You know, how do you enforce it? 615-737-1025 is the phone number. So speaking of defensive coordinators, I mean, Denard Wilson's going to have to work through this as 31 other defensive coordinators in the National Football League will have to as well. But, I mean, look, uh, speaking of Denard Wilson, he's got a riches of DBs to work with. Now that Legereus, the chains have traded for Legereus Sneed and, of course, picking up Shadobi Awuzi in free agency. What about the rest of the defense? We'll get into that coming up next. Caroline Willie D. Mays, 1025-1063, the game.
Caroline, Willie, D. Mays, 1025-1063, the game and the game Nashville app. We are streaming live on Twitch, Twitter, YouTube, and Facebook Live every single day. And we are live out here at Barrel House at Bridgestone Arena. The Predator is taking on the Vegas Golden Knights at home tonight. Puck drop at 7 o'clock. Pre-game coverage starting at 6 p.m. right here on 102.5 and 106.3 The Game. I think we all have a tendency, especially in sports, as soon as you get done with one thing, it's on to the next. Mm -hmm. Like the first thing that Patrick Mahomes said after winning the Super Bowl was, we're going for a three-peat. <laughs> like we were just saying, as soon as the Predators season wraps up, we're going to talk about next season, what Barry Trotz is going to do. We're always looking ahead to the next thing. Mm -hmm. Always hungry for the next game, the next season, the next draft, so on and so forth. Always looking ahead. So as soon as the Predators signed, or excuse me, traded for luxurious need, my first thought was, okay, great. The cornerback room's taken care of. What about the defensive line? And I, I think that both things can be true. That you can be really encouraged and excited about what the Titans have done in the offseason and signing Chidobi Awuzi and trading for Legereus Sneed, encouraged about what they can do, encouraged about what Denard Wilson has done and can do with his cornerback room, but also concerned about the defense as a whole because who's rushing the passer? Yeah, that's the, uh, you know, that's, that's the question. Um, after, you know, you add it, you know, two pretty good corners um, to the mix. Again, I still believe you have to add a safety, uh, another safety to the mix, and then get some depth. Um, but they added two guys that everyone feels comfortable about. That's not, that's no longer a position that we look at, and it's like, ah, oh, it's a question mark. Well, we have two starting corners. We have a starting nickel guy. Yes, you have to build up the depth behind it. Um, but it seems like, okay, we've, let, let's sort of, cross that one out as far as players we need at certain positions. Mm -hmm. But you're right, the defensive line um, is is one that hadn't been talked about much. Uh, why? Because you have Harold Landry and uh, Jeffrey Simmons on that defensive line. You have Arden uh, Key. Arden Key's a good, he's a good player, but he's a role player. He's mm -hmm. a situational player. Um, you know, now they have to find line, in, inside linebackers. Um, you know, um, how do you how do you bolster up this defensive line um, right now when there's really not much out there? So you have to wait, whether it be the draft or sort of guys being released, not necessarily because of they can't play, but because probably more so money or their age. They still plan, but teams tend to kind of go away from guys once they reach a certain age. Not that they're not playing good football, but they have a younger person behind them that they feel can get the job done. So, um, you know, the Titans are going to have to find whether it be guys they have on their team right now um, or guys they could potentially get in the draft or free agency. They got to find a way to bolster up this defensive line, which at one point was a strength, the strength mm -hmm. on their team. Now it's become sort of, it's not, it's become more of a, a question mark. Not because you don't think you have players, because you do. You have two really good players on the defensive line. But you don't have enough depth outside of those guys. You don't have guys that have been consistent playmakers in this league, and you need it. You don't have a replacement for Danigo Autry. Yeah, you got to find a replacement for Danigo Autry. Um, and listen, I was, you know, I was bummed out they didn't re-sign him. But it seems like, you know, ran. They tried to, you know, but they chose to go other places. You can't. You can only offer yeah. the I, money, I, and then the guys choose to go where they want to go. I, I, I'm going to stay with my consistent mm -hmm. approach. I, st I, I think right now, particularly where the roster is and with your draft, you don't have a third-round pick. You, you know, obviously, you'd love to see them address it in the draft if the right guy's there. You're probably going to get a defensive line in there somewhere, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. It's a line that's got to be in there somewhere, yeah. right? It, it may not be until the sixth round or something, and people would be like, why didn't they take a, why didn't they take an edge rusher with the 38th pick or whatever? Like, you, we're going to have that. Yeah. Debate, right, no matter who they pick with their second guy because they have a lot of needs, mm -hmm. a lot of needs. So somewhere in there, I'm thinking back to when they got Kyle Vandenbosch. Mm -hmm. I guarantee you the day that they signed Kyle Vandenbosch, we weren't talking about that on our show for two hours. Like, can you believe they just got Kyle Vandenbosch? This guy's going to be awesome. <laughs> he was a, a kind of a sitting there, a quiet bargain signing that turned out to be a perfect fit mm -hmm. right next to 
Albert Hainsworth, mm-hmm. right? So I think that's maybe what you're looking for is find a couple of guys maybe on the younger side mm-hmm. that are not expensive that maybe will – a guy like Jeffrey Simmons will bring out the best in, right? He's the right guy. Nobody heard of Tier Tart. The next no. thing you know, Tier Tart is playing great football next mm-hmm. to Jeffrey Simmons. That's the beauty of it is you still have Harold Landry, mm-hmm. right, who is encouraging – because he's come off a major injury and he looks like he's still pretty good and hopefully he's got another couple good years. And I do expect Harold Landry to be better this season than he was last. Yes. Just because coming off of the injury probably wasn't 110% ready to get back in there, wasn't 100% back to to strength. But I I still look at, you're losing Danico Autry in his double-digit sacks. Mm -hmm. Who do you find and where do you find to plug in that position. It's hard. And is do we start talking about potentially the Titans taking a defensive player in the first round of the draft? Potentially a, a Dallas Turner. No. I don't think so. I think the, no. the priority's got Why? to be surround Will yeah. Levis with the guys. First thing. And then you in the coming years yeah. you, you address the other part. Uh, my reason is and one, what Willie said, your main objective is to surround your quarterback and try to figure out is he the guy? Um, you already got, you know, one of the best defensive linemen in the National Football League in Jeffrey Simmons. Now you just need him to, you know, make sure he consistently play at that level. And, and he I can't think, do it by himself. Yeah, he can do it by himself. But I think this under, um, you know, Denar Wilson, I, I think, and I said this before, I think he's going to have the best season of his career thus far um, playing in this system. Uh, so if that is indeed the case to me, then it, it allows others to elevate their game. Um, how you choose to go get those guys, um, again, you don't need to go get, you know, all-world guys. You just need to find guys who you believe fit your system um, and that can, you know, um, learn this system very quickly. They talked about uh, Kenneth Murray Jr., that he may just as well – be, be perfect for this system because of what they're going to ask him to do. And we'll it see. works more toward his strength, and we will see. How does Denard Wilson, you know, once he gets these players in there, what where where is he putting them to maximize their their ability to play this game? You know, if you're getting a guy that that can, you know, tackle really well, what where what, what are you putting him in a space where he can be a tackling machine? Mm-hmm. You know. Are you got a guy that loves to blitz or can blitz well? Are you putting him in a position where he can show you that attribute that he has? That's what it's about, putting these guys in positions to succeed. Kenneth Murray Jr. may not have been an all-pro in, in, with, the, with the Chargers, L.A. Chargers, but he comes here in this system the way you probably want him to play, more toward his strength. He may end up being a bargain. You know, you know, you would hope for, that he is. Exactly, for what you pay and then the production you get out of him. But he also might not be. He might not be. But you're hoping that with Denar Wilson as your coordinator, you're hoping that, you know, he can maximize the potential that he has as a player. Not mm-hmm. just him, but all of them. But having a coach that hopefully, you know, that, that, that knows what he's doing, that has, you know, coach guys up, you hope that that translates to him now being a defensive coordinator. Mm-hmm. Because before, he just had control of his room, the secondary room. Now you have control of the whole, the whole defense. Yeah. How do you – are we going to see the same type of Denard Wilson that they had to play against? Are we going to see that type of, um, you know, coaching um, and aggressiveness? That's another thing is I'm really encouraged about mm-hmm. Denard Wilson and excited about everything that he's done, his resume, everything that he said. He said all the right things, but also this is his first time as a defensive yeah. coordinator. He's an unproven part of all of this as well. Is he a, is he a, does he like to blitz a lot? Does yeah. he not like to blitz? Is he one of those guys where I will get the rush with four guys? Mm-hmm. Four guys is the way to go. There mm-hmm. in this day and age, that does seem like the trend has been is don't blitz too much because those guys are too good. They're going to carve you up, and you're going to give up more big plays. So I don't know what his overall philosophy is. But if you have better corners, you can do that. Maybe you feel more comfortable you can blitz a little bit more. Mm-hmm. And maybe that's how you get a little extra juice on, on your pass rush, right? And right. deception is so much of it too, right? Yeah. If 
you can put them in third downs and you can disguise stuff. Down through. a distance. Yeah. A lot. And maybe game. bring out more out of your individual. They're, they're going to have to be more than the sum of their parts, right? Exactly. No matter, there's not enough guys out there that you can buy mm -hmm. a great defense. Mm -hmm. Number one, there's just not, you know, Two Harvey, guys out Harvey there. Martin and Randy yeah. White and Tutal Jones. They're not out there waiting. <laughs> Bruce Smith and, and if they are, maybe they're, they're 75 years old now. How old are those guys now? But I don't think they're going to get you half You know what I mean? Look, but so they're just going to have to be the best that they can be and be better than what they look at on paper right now if they're going to overachieve next year. And I'm not going to say right now that, oh, yeah, the Titans have to take a defensive player in the first round. You have to. But the, of course not. Because, one, you need a left tackle. Yeah. Like, where are you getting your left tackle? And, two, because – how many really good defensive players are in this draft? How many really good defensive linemen and pass rushers are in this draft? I would say Dallas Turner mm -hmm. is, pro is the first one that comes to mind, and I absolutely could be missing out on one. But really, overall, this is an, feels like an offensive draft of linemen and receivers and quarterbacks and Brock Bowers at the tight end position. But I think that we should at least ha entertain the conversation because mm -hmm. what if Joe Alt goes to the Chargers at five? What if you don't like Ola Fashnu at, at seven? What if nope. the receivers are gone? You know, you what if down. what if you trade back with the Denver Broncos at twelve, and Fashnu is gone, and Dallas Turner is the best player there? Well, you also need a defensive lineman. You also need uh, pass rushing help. Mm -hmm. So I'm not counting out defensive or a defensive lineman at all in the first round, of course I lean toward left tackle. Because if you do take Dallas Turner in the first round, then that brings up the question of who the hell is playing left tackle? And I think the number one priority of this offseason is and should be do whatever you can to help Will Levis, to protect Will Levis, to give Will Levis pass catchers, to just develop Will Levis better. But I'm not counting out defensive line at all in the first round, even though left tackle right now is and probably should be the priority. You never know what's going to happen on draft day. Yeah, you don't. And if, if if they were under that sort of type of scenario, then it's okay. Best player on the board. Who who yeah. who is it? If, uh, outside of a quarterback, it's like okay, who's the best player on the board? But to me, I, I just think because you already have some type of foundation there on the defensive line with Jeffrey Simmons mm -hmm. and Harold Landry, and I know Harold Landry is the outside backer, but still. He lines up on that front, even though you do have foundations um, on that on that defensive front. I think from an offensive standpoint, because everything is geared toward the quarterback, you have to find a way to protect your quarterback by all means necessary. So that would be that would be an unforeseen thing if it goes the way like if they can't get their tackle, if he's gone, if the receiver's gone, mm -hmm. you know then, you know, obviously there's nobody left that you deem as a first-round grade on the offensive line. So what do you do? Do you trade out of, you know, trade further down? And I don't know, but you have to solidify that left tackle position. Totally. I'm not even talking about the right tackle because, you know, <laughs> you need bookends. I get that. But I'm going to stick to what I've said for the last three or four months. You give me two more players on our offensive line, and they just got one with Cushion Bear, you give me another tackle, my offensive line is going to be okay. We're going to be fine. We're going to be fine because I trust the coach, mm -hmm. and we have something to build. Our left side, if we go get the tackle, we already got Skaronsky. We drafted the first round. Now we got Cushion Bear. That whole left side, right, say after the draft that, that happens, it's solidified. Mm -hmm. I just got to coach these guys up on the right side. You know, I coach them up on the right side, trust Bill Callahan. I don't need to go get a left tackle and a right tackle. It'd be People, nice. It would be nice, but that's not like my top priority. Like, I got to get me a right. Like, damn it, I got to get a right tackle. No, what you got to do is get your left tackle. Yes. You possibly got some right tackles mm -hmm. on your team. I agree with that. You know, you allow Bill Callahan to coach them up. They may not be great as long as they can get the job done, whether it combo connect or whatnot. If they can get the job done, I don't need you to be all pros. There are really good right tackles in this if league can get the job that are done. not all pros or pro bowlers. They just guys that come to work, get the job done, go home, come back again, get the job done. Guys, we don't even talk about it. The you, guys on the roster already that were there last year, yeah. they didn't get the job done. But, uh, but a lot of that was, uh, let's be frank about this. I, I'm just, they didn't have coaching. They didn't have damn coaching. They didn't. 
I've always said this about this, this franchise, at least since I've come back. The development at certain positions have not been there. They just haven't. The development of offensive line the last three years. It ain't just because of the players. Now, Dillard, that was, let's just throw that one out. But it ain't all because of the players. The coach got to coach him up. So whatever you coaching, it ain't working. Now, if, the, if Bill Callahan comes in here and this guy looks 20% better, then I'm going to tell you, it was damn coaching. That's what it was. These players have a talent. Just put them and coach them the right way. They'll get the job done. I believe that they will have that right side of the line solidified, whether they go out and get somebody or not. I think the two guys that they made, they said they're going to put Dylan Raines at guard. If you put um, PT at, at tackle, PT. let them play it. Let coach coach them. You know, it's not like, to me, he's only going to get better with the coaching. If we argued about the coaching last year was horrible, well, the coaching this year, based upon much his better. history, is much better, so, which means the players should get better. And you got to remember, this is only PD's, what, third year? Uh, it's third year. Yeah, That's... third year. So his first year, he shouldn't have been starting. He yeah. shouldn't have started his first year. Second year. He was suspended, suspended then hurt. Suspended, then hurt. When he was out there, he wasn't very it's, good. Exactly. It all, and right? he was injured. And and, was yeah. injured. But then now this is the year you got better coaching and you're healthy. You will be starting the season. There's no other excuses. So it's Bill Callahan's job to get him to play. Or he just might not be very good. What about Jalen Duncan? He's good. Possibility? He's, I think PT is a good player. Have we seen the best of him? No. I hope not. No. For but their I think sake, I hope is, not. I think he is a good player. Listen, one of these days y'all will believe me. The coaching there will make him better. It will. I guarantee you. Now, will he become an all-pro or a pro bowler? I don't know. But I think it will be good enough to be the right tackle, whoever they put at that position. They don't need to, again, you don't need to spend a lot of money to go get a right tackle. Just need to get the right right tackle with the right coach. And if that right tackle is on the roster right now, is yeah. to be seen. I don't know. They could have him. I, I, the hope is not a strategy. Mm -hmm. But if they, say, see, if they see something Can't in a Jalen Duncan. Can't fill every hole in one offseason. Yeah, that's what you, I'm saying. You, you, you got to gotta, gotta see what you got. You got to give have them to get a, a starter. And if they, Those if guys they look have at Nicholas started. Petit Frere, but they've started, but are they starters? We'll find like out. Andre this Dillard is started, but he's a not a starter. This is a uh, rebuilding. Andre, Andre Dillard is not a starter. It's I a know, but he started, and Aaron Brewer started. He is not a starter. He's not a starter. But you had to find out. Yeah. If we found out, and it was ugly. Right, yeah. but this is a new year. They're young. This is a rebuilding year. You find out what you got. 615... I am going to push back on that. I don't think it's a rebuilding year. I don't think that you trade for LeJarius Sneed and pick up Calvin Ridley in free I've thrown out the odds. You guys can say if what it's you a want. Year. If, if they have the longest odds of anybody in the league for, to win the Super Bowl, it's rebuilding. They have the longest odds of anybody in the They're league to third win the Super from Bowl? the bottom. <laughs> it, it, it's Carolina. It's maybe one other team, and it's the Titans. That's every every single one. Rebuilding they're teams going to be, they don't are, trade going, for Lajarius Sneed and going pay Calvin to be predicted Ridley $15 fourth. million. Dollars Even after agency. the Sneed, they will be predicted fourth in the South. I think that Houston was also predicted fourth to finish in the South yeah. this past season. That doesn't mean it's not a rebuilding year. I don't think If that they you, overachieve, like the Predators were overachieving, that's great. I don't but think that you make the moves the Titans you're made if you're they're rebuilding. rebuilding. They, have a new, they, they have a new quarterback. Mm -hmm. They have a new tailback. They, have, they don't have Kevin Byer. They change coaches. It's rebuilding. That is the definition of rebuilding. It's a new era. I don't, but I don't think that's an excuse to not be good. They're not going to be good. I don't think you not go likely. after Calvin Ridley they're and the Jerry Sneed if you don't plan on winning some football games. They're going to win some football games. I but but they're, it's, you can it's win six or seven. But it's all subjective. Six or what is seven? Good? What is good? But, it's That's what I'm saying. Good. If you're okay, you're going to win six or seven. Winning nine, That's 10, 11, bad. that's different. Si that's where they are. Six and that's 11 is bad. Everybody will predict them to win six or seven games next year. And I what, think no I who they draft. Houston to, to win six or seven games last year. All I'm saying is. Right. It doesn't mean they can't happen. This is the NFL. Want. Crazy things happen. Surprise teams happen every year. It will be a surprise if they win more than six or seven next year, where they are. I don't know if I agree. Look at the, all the odds. So you're saying all of the, the odds, odds makers are wrong. I don't care. Okay, I'm let's not talk saying about, they're wrong. Okay, the let's talk about the I'm saying I don't Look care at the what, what their Look, odds name, are to name win Name their the best Super players. Bowl. Start listing their best players. After about four or five, you're going to find that you're looking for, I don't know, like, what do you got? What do you got? I mean, I, I it you. is four or five more than it was a few weeks ago. Okay, but, I can you, look but at you Calvin also Ridley. lost Derrick Henry. You lost Ryan Tannehill. You lost... 
Kevin Byer. You, you, you're losing guys. Uh -huh. Look at the roster. List the players, the, the power rankings of your players. You're going to find it's a thin, thin roster. You better have a no, heck you, of a draft. Well, I mean, you guys could be optimistic. You, hey, listen, Look, you, know, you guys were the guys who had 10 or 11 wins last year, and I was like, ah. I, 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 Okay. I'm All trying I, to be realistic and say that if I'm you trying are, to be, I'm trying to be realistic. You guys are optimistic. If you are going, if <laughs> you guys are calling for, they're going to be okay. They, right, they have hey, a listen, ton of hope. Okay, still. we can get back to this on the other side. Yeah, okay, 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 we can get we, back to yeah. this. On, My this point is, is because discussion. coming up next, I want to get your thoughts yes. on the kickoff rules. My uh -huh. point is, if you pay Calvin Ridley fifty million dollars and guarantee Lejarius need fifty five, and you win six games. Somebody's going to get fired. No, I don't think Nobody's so. Nobody's getting fired. Because but there you are will setting be. the expectation in free agency that you plan on being good. You don't play. That's not. That's that you plan on winning games. Because I don't think that you guarantee Calvin Ridley $50 million just to be the fourth best team in a not very good division. Somebody's going to finish fourth. <laughs> somebody's going to well, finish somebody fourth. Well, somebody has to finish right, fourth. And they're all spending it money. Have everybody's to be spending you. the same amount of money. Everybody's spending money. Everybody, it's a salary cap. Everybody's spending money. I think that you should have higher expectations because they're, <laughs> they're spending the money. Like, this is my philosophy. Did the Predators set high expectations for this year? No, they kept them low. And, and the they, expectations have changed. Uh -huh. Right, to their credit. Yes, Surprising, absolutely. Surprisingly so. That's the approach the Titans should take. I All think right. you should have higher expectations. <laughs> because then if you lose a bunch of games and you can say, oh, well, the expectations were low anyway. No. The expectations are low. I think your expectations low. should be higher. The expectations Don't spend are that much money if your expectations are low. Okay. 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 I, I've, said, I've said enough. That's all I'm saying. Okay. Mm. This conversation is going to go throughout the entire summer. Yeah. We can, we can come back to it. The prediction, you just watch. Look at the power rankings every day. I don't care about the power rankings, okay. frankly, All right. because anything can happen. Because I know anything can happen. I know, frankly. <laughs> <laughs> no, Frank, frankly. <laughs> All right, coming up next, I do want to get DeMaze's thoughts on the kickoff rule changes, and we'll do that coming up next. Caroline Willie, DeMaze, 102.5, 106.3, The Game.
And Willie D. Mays, 1025-1063, The Game and The Game Nashville app. We're brought to you by Zen Sports. Start earning cash rewards on your bets today. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-889-9789. Terms and conditions apply. Must be 21 or older and in Tennessee to bet. We are broadcasting from the Spring Hill Heating and Cooling Game Nashville Studios. And right now, today, our Spring Hill Heating and Cooling Game Nashville Studios is Barrel House at Bridgestone Arena because the Predators are in action tonight, taking on the Vegas Golden Knights. It is a big one tonight. So do we want to do kickoff or do we want to do phones? I'll let you make that decision. Um, uh, can we the do kick, them both? The, the kickoff rule will be there all yeah. summer long. Let's debate. get to some phones. I, I like. I want to hear from the people. Phone yeah. lines are driven by Wilson Maybe someone's going to tell me I'm cr- completely nuts. Yeah, well, Mark and Paris says that you're full of bleep. Good. <laughs> Good. <laughs> Look, I'm just trying to be the, the voice of reason here. It's exciting to win the free agency press conference, which they have. Mm-hmm. And, and it's because they don't have players that they've drafted that are ready for the second contract. Mm-hmm. That's where you should invest. You have the quarterback on the rookie deal. You had a quarterback on a rookie deal. You, and, and off the books are Tannehill's contract, Derek Henry. So you have a lot of money. money. But this doesn't mean that they have made this huge leap. They're going to be right in the same mix of teams last year trying to overachieve to win nine or ten games. That's how I see them. If they, over, if they win that many, it will be because they overachieve mm-hmm. and because Will Levis takes a big jump, which could happen. That's a big part but of it. I don't know. I, I feel like the more realistic view is he's going to have some really good games and probably some struggles as well at this stage of his career. And That's you, realistic. I, I think that is realistic because we see – if they, don't have, great, have, if they don't have a great defense that's going to make up for those night or those days where he's looking like a second year inexperienced guy. Well, in the last segment I said if the Titans win six or seven games, someone's gonna get fired, and that someone could be Will Levis. If the Titans are winning six or seven games, that would lead me to believe the quarterback probably isn't playing very well. Yeah. And this season, I view this offseason as give Will Levis everything that he needs. Protection, pass catcher, so on and so on, coaching. Give him everything he needs. If he has a better situation around him, and that's assuming they address the left tackle position in the draft, and he's still – if this team is struggling, he's struggl- he's, he is struggling, he's turning the ball over, then you need to evaluate your options. That if you win six or seven games, you're probably picking in the top five, top ten, that you would be in that quarterback might be the territory. Best thing. That might be the best thing. And maybe this is the put-up or shut-up here for Will Evans. They need, another, decide they need more what good players. Is. The well, only way to replenish is the draft. Ozzie Newsom. I'm quoting yeah. Ozzie Newsom. No, I'm saying if you're to have a top five pick, maybe that's a quarterback pick. Well, let's hope it's not that bad. I, I hope you don't have to scrap this whole plan after one year. I, I think he's going to do well enough that you feel like he's taking steps forward. But if he does well enough and he takes steps forward, I think that in and of itself is better than six or seven wins. Yeah, not necessarily. I think uh, a lot of it is, is, is predicated on how. Uh, Will Levis plays now that that you see what they're adding around him, just from an offensive standpoint, not mm-hmm. necessarily from a defensive standpoint. They got him another running back. They got him a re- another receiver. Um, you got you a center. Hopefully you can address the left tackle position in the draft. So just by that alone, you think, okay, from what we've seen in the, uh, of Will last year, now you're putting him in a position where you think he's going to be better protected then we should see better play, which should equal to a better record okay. than we had last year. What else are the people saying? Who, but, who wants a piece of me? <laughs> Bring it on! <laughs> Willie's why I wanna. Uh, Skyler Texan says, this is an eight-win team next year. All they've done is submit anchors on the team. Need two more drafts to build. Eight, eight would be, it, it, there's, there's different types of eight. There's right? a, eight and nine is not creating. But anything. I feel like they could win eight, and you'd feel really good about the progress of where it's going. If Levis is showing progress, mm-hmm. if if um, Calvin Ridley looks like he's worth the money, if Snead looks like he has a good year, if Simmons stays healthy, and maybe you find a couple other things, I think eight and nine could could be a good year. I think you could feel like you're moving in the right direction. I'm being realistic. I think it depends. But also, whenever it, this texture says need two more drafts to build. I, Based I, on absolutely. W- what if Will Levis pops this year? Is that likely? Really? Why not? Yeah. I mean, I, I would say it's. Why not? I think he should. You've seen likely. him play. No, no, is it's is just he going to become likely. Joe Burrow? Just uh, as likely Not in to one me. year. Joe I, Burrow became Joe Burrow in his second year. Is he Joe Burrow? I don't know. No. 
No, he's not Joe Burrow. He's Let's more, be real. He's he, not Joe Burrow. He's more He could likely, be really good. He's more likely to pop. Let's be realistic. Just as he is to not pop. I think it's it, – right now we're in a space where it can go either way. It could – anything he could can, happen he with He's not Joe Burrow. I know, I'm, I'm, not, ready I'm, to, not, I'm listen, prepared to say that. I am not saying he's Joe Burrow, but – He could he be really good. But he doesn't have to be Joe Burrow to have a t- nine, ten-win season. He just needs to be a quarterback that's good and – don't get into don't get into those bad habits like he got into last year right. a few times. Mm-hmm. You guys are talking a about a, a, a situation where they can. Uh, to me, if he pops and they overachieve to win nine or ten, that would be awesome, and that could happen. Yeah. But I'm saying it's much more realistic and much more. The uh, probability uh, suggests they're much more mediocre, seven eight wins, uh, than they are nine or ten wins. It's just the way the roster I is right now. They have too many misses in the draft. Uh-huh. They don't have depth on the roster. I think you're speaking. And they lost their they it. lost their franchise guy who has carried them for years. And Derrick Henry is a new era. I think you're speaking of, speaking from the from from the standpoint of from a national narrative. Like if they win eight games, that's like that's big because we didn't even predict them to win eight games. If they oh. win nine or ten, damn, that's overachievement because we only picked them to win seven. From a national standpoint, you're looking at this team and you're saying, well, that's just a seven, maybe eight win team. But once you start to see these guys practice or whatnot, just like the Predators, once they start playing, then there's a better determination of who they can be. And all of it, let's just say a lot of it depends on how well the quarterback plays. And to me, they're surrounding him with with weapons. They're solidifying his offensive line. From what I've seen last year, if he has time to throw, then this kid can spin the ball. He's making right decisions. When he's not, when he's not making right decisions, that's because somebody's in his lap. All right. What else are the somebody's people? Who else wants back? a piece of me? Uh, one texter says, uh, I feel like Willie's scared to be optimistic. <laughs> he's a play it Coach safe Willie. kind of guy. <laughs> Love is in this team are I'm not a play it safe kind I, of team anymore. I'm the most glass half full kind of guy there is. <laughs> I'm trying to be realistic here. I'm trying to, to temper expectations. Uh, look, I will say this all the way up until kickoff of the first game. Mm-hmm. They're making a mistake if they're going to sell this team as a team that's going to go out and win. The AFC South. I would, I would say this is a new era. It's wide open. We've got a new quarterback. We've got a lot of rebuilding to do. And I, I don't think it's bad to say you're rebuilding for a year. Now, but you can't I'll be the first football. to say that you can't, you can't, can't, sell, you can't roll that out there. Yeah. After, you, I think you can for one year. You can't for two years. But I don't for think one year, you can. I don't think that you can and use And you're missing that an opportunity to do that. I don't think you can use that messaging when you go out and do what the Titans have done so yeah, far. Yeah, you sign those guys. They, had to, they didn't have anybody. They didn't they have didn't to sign have Calvin Ridley. They had no players. They, they didn't had have to, to sign go Calvin Ridley. They could have signed Hollywood Brown. Right, but they, they didn't ha- have to trade for Legereus uh, Legereus Need. They could have gone out no. and gotten a whole hum no, corner they, for on a one year deal. They had to. They had to spend that money because they had so little talent left over, and they had no draft picks that you had to reinvest in. So that's how they had that money. To be able to go and do that, they but that doesn't money. cover all of the huge, they, all of the weakness. These guys will help, no question. But they, they're not single-handedly going to turn them into a team that's going to be predicted to win the division. Well, predicting to win the division and winning nine or ten games are different. I think the way that this this division is shaping up to be, uh, the winner of it's going to win 11, 12 games, probably more like twelve. Um, the Titans still could end up winning nine or ten games, but not winning the division and not even making the playoffs. Um, I would still deem that as a success, but a lot of it depends on how the quarterback plays. Yes, you signed Ladarius Knee, which I think was an upgrade. Yeah, you signed Chidobe Awize. I think that's an upgrade. Yes, you signed Cushionberry, definitely an upgrade from mm-hmm. what you have. You're gonna sign your, you're gonna get your left tackle. Um, all that helps the team. But what really pushes the team over is the play of the quarterback. If this quarterback plays well, this, I promise you, this is a 10-win team. If the quarterback plays well, if he plays winning football, this is a 10-win team because they're going to go out and they're going to get their left tackle, hopefully, and they're going to add other pieces, and they're going to add more depth. With the front-line guys that they have, with the exception of the linebackers, we've got to upgrade the linebacker position, the safety position, I think they have a roster – that can win 10 games if the quarterback 
shows that he's making that progression that he needs to make. It needs to be a, it needs to be like a, you know, one one island to the next jump. That's how big it needs to be for Will Levis. Quarterback Lee. We'll continue this conversation coming up next. And the Predators have a big one tonight, so we'll get into that coming up next. Caroline Willie D. Mace. Go to thegamenashville.com slash bracket challenge and fill out your 16-team bracket to compete to win great prizes, including tickets to see Kings of Leon at Bridgestone Arena on September 26th. One or two five of the Game Bracket Challenge brought to you by ESPN Bet Sportsbook, Twin Peaks, and Volunteer Hose and Gasket. Happy March Madness Tuesday, everybody. I know you saw the girls' basketball games yesterday. I mean, that Kansas-USC game was good, even though Juju sort of took over the second half. Obviously, the Iowa game was close. Um, Caitlin, what, she put up 30 or close to 30. Um, so if you were betting last night on the women's March Madness, I know you were doing it with our partners, um, Zen Sports. So if you want to move forward, because games are about to start hitting back again, people for March Madness. So if you're going to make your bets, do it with our partners in sports. And I am here to tell you about their introductory promotion, as I have been telling you for the last couple of months, available to all the new customers in, in, in Tennessee. It's the No Danger First Wager. When you sign up for Zen Sports account, you will receive up to $1,000 No Danger First Wager. When you place your first bet on Zen Sports, you will be reimbursed for the amount of your bet if it loses up to $1,000. Plus, Zen Sports has launched their VIP program for the premier bettors of Tennessee. If you think you might qualify, then listen up. The VIP program is by invite only okay so if you feel that your zen sports play qualifies for the vip consideration please check out the program details and apply at zensports.com slash vip no other sports book will offer you a premier sports betting experience with 24 7 top tier customer support and bigger and better action than zen sports so what are you waiting for betters get going and download their app at zensports.com today zen sports where betting just got better and remember Gambling problems call 1 800 889 9789. Terms and conditions apply. Must be 21 years or older to bet here in Tennessee.
Sunshine, Willie D. Mays, live out here at Barrel House at Bridgestone Arena. Predators in action with a big one tonight, but want to get into your Titans thoughts. Willie said, hey, temper expectations, and I say, hey, Calvin Ridley, Shadobi Awuzie, a luxurious need. Those are not temper expectations moves, but I want to get your thoughts on that. Doug is on the line with a thought on the Titans. What's up, Doug? Yeah, Ron. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Will, w Willie. Hey, Doug. Hand me one of those pom toms, brother. I'm Team Willie. <laughs> <laughs> Why, Doug? Because I, I kept hearing if the quarterback, if the line, if this. My dad used to say, if and hope, and hope is a team with a boat that don't float. <laughs> we all if this team together, but hope is a boat that don't float. Any pro bowl ball players on this team? <laughs> one of them left. Got a kicker and Big Jeff. Oh, right, come on. About, Calvin Ridley? What, uh, come on, Harold Landry? Legereus Sneed? Come on, now. He, he, he was Shinobi? not last year. Let's go off of that. Let's Who was that? Well, that's all we have Again. to go off of. Harold Landry? That's it. Oh, okay, he wasn't a pro bowl. Harold Landry okay. got you two okay, double digits. Well, I'll give. I will grant you guys the names you, you so, just so, mentioned, let me but say, then let let's keep going. What about right players here. 6 through 12 and 12 through 18? There's there's a lot of holes there, realistically. And, the, and Doug, and thank you for your call. Uh, when Delaney Walker came, uh -huh. there was a lot. There was a lot to grow, and Delaney had to watch this team look like garbage. Yeah. Thank you for your call, Doug. Yeah, Delaney's point, first year was not. They weren't real bad. good. He played on some rough teams. He was yeah, about yeah. all they had for yeah. a couple years. To the point. Look, uh, hope's not a strategy, and yeah. I will be the first one to say that's what I said about Nicholas Petit Frere. You can hope that he can turn into a starting right tackle, mm -hmm. but I, do you have to find some insurance? Probably. Well, of course you got. And to. you hope yeah. Will Levis pops, and you hope all of this fits, and you hope Brian Callahan is the right answer. We don't know if they are. This could be a six-win team, but I'm saying if this is a six-win team. There's going to be changes, whether it's quarterback changes, whether it's coach changes. We know this owner can change her, her mind on a dime. Mm -hmm. well, so that's is it a six-win team? But Maybe. That's what that's I'm saying. I think you could win six or seven but still feel like you're moving in the right direction. You find, you find what you have and what you don't have. But in, in all reality, you're probably going to take two, at least two. I, I would love to see it be done in two but maybe three until you really build with draft after draft. The only way you can really get better is to draft well. And they, they whiffed on and they three drafts. Well. They whiffed. That last year's draft was good. The three drafts before that, we just we read it off last week, d -Mace. Yeah, we did. If in you saw the names. If in so January. Half those guys aren't even in the, like, they're high picks, not even in the league, not even just like okay players who haven't panned out. They just don't have foundational players that they have drafted for those three years, and that is catching up to them. In January 2025, if this is a 6-11 and 11 team, will you feel like it's moving in the right direction? It, I need to see what it looks like. But, I but, won't. Well, what do you do then to scrap everything and start over again? Then you were rebuild. What is that? That is a rebuild. Well, I think that they're at 6-11. and 11. Why are you 6-11? and 11? Is it because your quarterback continues to turn the ball over and he hasn't made No, it's because of what I just said. You don't have enough players that you drafted mm -hmm. that have turned into good foundation players. Well, I'm saying if it and is that because will be of the, the quarterback, you find a new quarterback. That's what, uh, this is what I think this season is. What's Will Levis? Is he your franchise quarterback? Do you feel good about moving forward with Will Levis or not? You make, well, up that, you make uh, your decision. A lot of it, listen, it, it depends on, you know, obviously the progression of Will Levis. And then how quickly are, are these guys going to get on the same page with the head coach? That's basically what it is. Yeah, it that's a, that is a big thing. How, how does the system, yeah. how does this coach and the system, they, they, how quickly remember, they went 1-11. and 11. Tie together. Callahan was on a, what, when he first joined that Bengals staff, they went 1-11. and 11, But he felt good about where it was going. Mm -hmm. That was his opening press conference. And was then they not? drafted Joe Burrow, and that, yeah. that was really the difference. Yeah, well, because they were 1-11, and 11, and they got the yeah. pick first. Yeah, but what Joe is Burrow the, is the difference. A quarterback is the difference. I'll, I'll say this is a foundational. This is a see what you got, build the foundation. Wherever the record is, you can still be moving in the right direction. I got to win in nine or ten games. They better. Okay. <laughs> Good luck. Good luck. Go, team, go. That's going to do it for us today. We'll be back tomorrow at 11 a.m. Still in the company's up next. Be love, love, love.